Okay, so you can hear me, right? So as I said, this is actually live. So if I get stuck in the middle, I might be having an actual stroke, not a video problem. Um, so, uh, I, so I wanted to talk to you about helping our robot overlords help us. Um, so I have been mostly uh, for, for most of my time in, um, in planning research, I've been working on actually um, generating uh, plants, uh, synthesizing plants uh, in all sorts of uh, scenarios um, you know, with uh, different kinds of expressive models, different types of optimization metrics, different levels of model completeness. And I honestly haven't really spent that much time with the uh, plan recognition. I mean, I almost, I was of the opinion, I guess, that those who can plan and those who can't recognize. Uh, so Chris Grebe is not here, so it's fine, I can say this. Uh, things have changed uh, for me uh, when I started getting interested in um, human AI interaction and in particular human aware AI systems and human aware planning systems. Um, and so, you know, uh, I gave a talk about this at AAAI, there's a magazine article on that. In general, I was trying to get a sense of what would be involved in trying to get AI systems to fluidly collaborate uh, with the humans uh, in the loop. Um, so obviously I don't necessarily have to say uh, too much about why AI systems should be interacting with humans and why this is important. You know, there are all sorts of areas uh, starting from the obvious ones like intelligent tutoring systems and social robotics. Uh, we basically actually need even beyond that pretty much anywhere uh, people are interacting with uh, AI decision systems such as human aware digital personal assistants or office or hospital assistants. Um, you know, they are in teaming scenarios, you will wind up needing uh, the kind of human AI interaction and how to actually, how can uh, uh, AI agents with their planning capabilities help uh, humans. Uh, there are, this is something that sort of caught on quite a bit now. There's, uh, um, you know, several programs specifically looking at this. DARPA has assist program as well as an adapt program. And I'm told there are more programs that are coming up. Uh, apparently, everybody has discovered humans uh, and uh, want AI systems to work with humans. We'll talk about this a little later too. Uh, so this is a sort of thing that I was uh, most um, um, got interested in. And I was particularly looking at what does it take for AI an agent to show interpretable behavior in the presence of human agents. And my short um, you know, a sound bite is essentially obviously that um, we, the, they need to acquire and manage uh, mental models. I mean, this crowd uh, doesn't need particularly uh, to be convinced of this. Uh, social intelligence involves uh, dealing with mental models as you can see from as far back as the salient test. Um, and, and so this is the kind of uh, direction that I've been looking at. We have bunches of papers in this uh, and we are even crazy enough to start writing a book on this. Um, and the specific work that actually there's like an overview talk of all these different efforts that we are involved in this, um, you know, is actually a clean version of that. The most recent one that's available on the web um, is this talk I gave at the Samsung AI forum. Um, and that, you know, if you are looking for something clean and well put together, uh, that's the YouTube talk, uh, the recorded version that you should be watching. Uh, in particular, it also has Korean subtitles. So, you know, I guess it's always a good thing to have, um, but I won't do that. Instead, in this talk, what I thought I'll do and, you know, is to sort of pair my work, um, you know, with uh, pairing rather, you know, with HAI. Uh, so sort of try to make connections to what I, what we've been doing um, with the uh, plan recognition community, obviously we are all connected, but I thought I'll try to take a, a separate, a different look at uh, much of what happens in human AI interaction from the perspective of plan recognition. Clearly a solitary AI agent can be happy with uh, planning and acting all by itself. It's a happy life, you know, uh, but once you start cohabiting with other agents, especially humans, whether to either assist or collaborate or avoid or deceive, 
you will wind up having to recognize the plans, goals, and intentions of those humans in the loop. That's for sure. I think most of you will agree with that already. But it's also, you need to, you the AI agent, need to make it easier for the humans to recognize your plans, goals, and intentions. And that's like the second other thing, and that winds up being actually quite important. Um, and that's what sort of leads to the notions of interpretable behavior as well as uh, providing explanations. Um, and I'll try to get back to that. So my aim you know, in this talk uh, is to put the body of our work in terms of uh, uh, model recognition, model following paradigm. Um, and um, I'll get back to that, you know, more details on that in a minute. And then that sort of brings out the direct connections to plan recognition uh, a lot more clearly. I think some of you obviously, you know, are, are already working in this area, but even others who just thought of plan recognition with no humans at all connected uh, or, you know, human uh, interaction connected might see more connections this way. Um, I do want to say that this is a workshop talk. I kind of tried to make, I mean, you know, Sarah and Ruth were asking, do I have like a, a video? And I, my uh, fallback was to show a video of a talk that was done before, but I just can't do that, especially for you guys, you know, who woke up um, and, and then showed up. So I sort of put together this talk by not doing anything the last week, uh, but it is sort of uh, not all, you know, crisp and clean. So, um, you know, hopefully that will lead to a lot of questions, but I just want to mention that. And before I go forward, I should basically point out that, you know, much of this work um, that I'm talking about is done in the context of, you know, my group, um, um, you know, these, all these guys, some of them might be in the audience and they'll be cringing anyway, because I'll be mangling their work and trying to put it in some uh, separate uh, schema. Uh, but you know, so so be it. So you get to see them here. Um, and um, so let's start with uh, uh, my. I guess what I'm trying to do is look at what we do in the context of this model recognition, model following paradigm. And let me walk you through that. Um, so let's start with the tail of key models. Um, so first of all, I want to mention that when I say model, obviously in planning community. Um, a periodical model just typically is just the actions with preconditions and effects. But I take in this talk, uh, as well as now work, the more general view that a model really is the initial state, the goal state, the action, the action models, the observational models, and even the plan that the agent is trying to uh, do. So any of these pieces, if you wind up recognizing them, that would be sort of model recognition. Keep that in the back of your uh, mind. Um, so keep, given that, um, so the single agent planning that we all know and uh, are uh, happy with is clean enough. So um, if you have a robot, uh, it has a model MR, and then it just basically uses of the model of the environment and its initial and goal states, and it uses that as well as its observation model to actually come up with a policy to go from, you know, you know to reach the goals. That much we understand. Um, now the problem comes when a human is uh, fit, put in the loop. Um, when you put the human in the loop, then uh, uh, the first thing you need to look at is that the human might have their own model of the tasks to be performed. So they can have different goals. They might be in a different initial state. Um, they might have actually different capabilities, different actions. Um, and much work in plan recognition really has been focused on recognizing this M of H. Um, so when the robot winds up recognizing M of H, it has some kind of an approximation of it. We can call it M of H R. Um, and it, this M of H R has, can be used by the agent to anticipate human behavior in order to do, do a whole bunch of things, yeah. assist, yeah. So avoid, <laughs> team, et cetera. Um, so we have done that, but there's also a large amount of work in, in fact, the original idea of plan recognition came from this idea that if you know what people are trying to do, maybe uh, you can use that to help them. 
So MHR is essentially the, the first of the interesting models that the robot has to recognize, the AI system has to recognize. So there is obvious clear-cut connection to plan recognition that I don't need to tell you guys, you all already know of that. Um, the second interesting part is when humans are interacting with AI systems, they can't help but have models of the uh, system in their own head. So in general, we always sort of assume this is the whole theory of mind idea that if they're actually working with uh, you know, um, an AI system, which seems to have reasonable capabilities, they will start having some approximate idea about what they think this robot's goals uh, intentions as well as its observation model, as well as its actions are. So that is really MR of H. So this is the human sort of thinking, this is what the robot is capable of doing and is supposed to do. And the robot now, the AI system now has to, in addition to actually figuring out MHR, now has to recognize this MRH and not only recognize it, but needs to use it in um, you know, in, in, in making its behavior. In particular, when it has this MRH approximation, this allows the agent to anticipate human expectations in order to either conform to those expectations. Uh, so basically, if you just do what the humans expect according to the model they have of the uh, AI system, then they are not surprised, they're not asked questions, everything is happy. In fact, I keep saying that if you do what the world expects you to do, you never have to open your mouth. Nobody uh, would be as surprised and you never have to talk to anybody either. Um, but on the other hand, conforming to expectations, either in real life for us or for you know uh, AI systems can actually be costly. And, and so instead they would actually have to realize that when they do what is optimal for them, the humans would be surprised and so you, they will have to explain their behavior uh, in terms of the expectations that the humans have and which typically winds up having to change MRH uh, by communicating you know, how their uh, idea of the capabilities of the robot or AI system are actually wrong. And these are the following changes that they'll have to make. So I think of that, this explanatory dialogue really as this communication part. So, um, this uh, is actually the sort of the more important slide. And in fact, it was supposed to animate, but for some reason it didn't. So let me just go through uh, step by step. This is sort of the cycle that I want you to think of. And I will then talk about most of our work in terms of the pieces of this cycle. So a longitudinal human AI interaction cycle goes sort of like this approximately, you know, the. AI system starts with an initial estimate of MRH, what it thinks the human has, in addition to MHR, which you know, I assume you all know that you know, the robots are always supposed to recognize. And so it, this MH, MRH, um, you know, the, how to get that initial estimate, we'll talk later, but in general, sometimes it is provided as part of the common shared model. Sometimes the AI agent has to learn from existing behavior traces. And then the loop starts that as you interact, the AI system and the human are interacting. In there's, a, there's a phase where there's this model following phase where in essence, you are conforming to people's expectations. And there's a model communication phase where you say, no, look, I'm sick of the model you have of me. I'm going to change your model of me. And in the model following, come these two kinds, several kinds of things, one, you know, two of which you may have heard of is explicability that I will talk about here, which is do exactly the behavior human expects you to do given their MRH, given their model of you. And of course the predictability is even if you don't do the full model, at least make your behavior conform locally to the expectation. So sort of make it predictable. A model communication on the other hand is to, you are trying to correct the MRH, you are trying to revise it, you know, so that people, the, the human in the loop will get a better sense of what actually your capabilities, your AI systems capabilities are. And this is where I would say, you think in terms of legibility kind of ideas, which are essentially communicating the goal that I'm actually trying to go to. So I'm sort of signaling. Uh, explanation, explanation of course is signaling, communicate the changes of the model. Um, and then design, which is another way of communicating, 
is to sort of change the environment completely such that given the environment, people will, uh, the human in the loop will realize uh, that will have a better idea of the model that you know they uh, the, of, of the the uh, AI system. In the context of um, um, explanations, for example, you could either do the head, heads up during the planning or post facto when people ask for that explanation. Uh, and in the context of design, uh, again, of course, you know people like uh, Sarah and Ruth are here. You know they've all been talking about this design. In fact, we have some work with Sarah um, and the. Design is can be hard, not in uh, terms of hard in terms of the it's very hard to do, but it can be hard way, you know, hard coded into the environment, or it could be soft in the sense I will the AI system stops showing you know some behavior, some actions, just so that people will have a easier time of modeling it, and both of those are possible. So. I'd like to think of what happens in this longitudinal human AI interaction cycle in terms of these pieces, model following, model communication. And then of course, there's this beginning part about how to get an initial estimate. And so what I would like to do is, you know, quickly try to put, you know, pigeonhole the various pieces that of work that we have done into this uh, loop, starting from, of course, the explicability, that's where the arrow is showing. So again, in, in, in the case of explicability, what basically what you're saying is uh, that the robot's task model might be different from the human's expectation. So the consequence of it is that the plans that are optimal to the robot may not be so in human's expectation, so they'll become inexplicable. So of course, there are two options. One is confirm, and since we are in the confirm phase, that's the explicable planning. And the other is the communicate, which is the explanations that we'll talk you know, right after that. Again, so in just this is, I mostly went with the, the topics rather than example, but here's one example that I wanted to show. Um, so just so that, you know, we are on the somewhat of the same page. So think of this scenario where the human is a commander sitting in a remote location and the robot is on the ground. And in the beginning, they start with a shared model of the environment, the map of the environment. And essentially then this robot is going around uh, trying to maybe look for uh, you know, injured people or, or making its way to the environment. And of course the human has the original map, but the robot actually is on the ground. So it knows what has changed. And so the map may actually have changed. So there's already a model difference. And so in this particular case, in the first example, um, what happens is that the, the human is expecting that the shortest path that the robot will take is a particular path. But it turns out that in this case, we put an obstacle there. And rather than just take the second shortest path, in this particular case, the robot decides to confirm to the shared model, which involves actually doing additional work, such as removing the obstacle and just so that you will get to the, the same place. So that's sort of what explicability goes. And as you can see, you know, our poor pitch was forced to pick up hard, heavy uh, rubble. Uh, so in some sense, it would have been easier to just for it to take the second optimal path because this particular path has been closed. Uh, and, and so normally looking for explicable plans involves sort of this a secondary objective um, you know, for your optimization, not only are you trying to minimize the cost of the plan that you're trying to find, but you're trying to minimize the distance between the plan you're finding and the plan that the human would have expected given that they think you have MRH as your model. So in essence, you're trying to kind of figure out this sort of a multi-model planning. Not only are you trying to find a plan that's valid in the current model, but it's also uh, closer to what would be an optimal plan in this magical model that the human has of you. And in fact, the magical model might be such that you can't actually exactly do the plan that the human expects you to do. In this particular, in the previous example, if that particular obstacle is heavy and it cannot be lifted at all, then the robot is actually not going to be able to take the shortest path at all at that point of time. So the closest it could do is something nearby. So that's the explicability. Uh, the explanation is to say, to heck with it, I'm going to do what is actually better for me. And I'm going to communicate the model changes to the humans. Um, and of course, when you're talking about model changes, the simplest thing is to try to say, here's my brain, take it. 
and then you will talk, look at the world just like me. But obviously that is way too costly uh, for, from the cognitive load perspective for the humans in the loop. So you want to just provide, uh, communicate the minimal changes that they need to actually make to their model MRH of you, um, you know, so that they will be able to make sense of your behavior. So in this particular case, uh, Again, um, if I can make this work, so it actually is taking a different path and it's yelling at the top of its head that that particular other path is uh, actually closed and so I'm taking a different path. So basically it's just showing the piece that needs to be changed in the human's model so that they would understand um, it's, uh, it's new, that, that the, the, the best plan left is this other one. Um, so, so, uh, somebody's uh, mic is on, if they might uh, mute it. So uh, the explanations as model reconciliation in this particular case, so the explanation process in essence is figuring out the small change epsilon that needs to be made uh, to MRH so that the human can then see your, mod, your behavior as optimal and then communicating that to the human, okay? So that's why it's being, explanation itself is just becoming changing others' mental model of you. That's what is the, the thing piece to keep in mind. Um, and we talked about how these sort of explanations can be computed as a search in the space of models. And in depending on the way the search is constructed, is actually conducted, you can wind up getting different kinds of explanations with different kinds of properties. Um, and the, all that fun uh, stuff uh, comes there from, from you know, in, in terms of computing as search of in, in the space of explanations. The other thing that, you know, more recently, I think uh, last AAAI, um, um, we showed, I think Sharat and, uh, you know, other people, including Christian Mirzi and of course, Tadhajata, um, have this paper, which basically shows that really you can combine explicability and explanation uh, into like a single planning model, which is essentially sort of an epistemic planning model with expectation aware planning, um, where we are trying to plan in the presence of external expectations and MRH is really external expectations on your behavior. And so you can, and, and then you then have actions which not only have ontic effects, but also have epistemic effects. And some of these actions might be communicative, so they only have epistemic effects. And some of these actions are actually normal ontic actions, but also have epistemic effects. And if you use these together, both, both these expectations and your model together, then you can set up a, a single planning framework uh, with the two models, MR and MRH, and, and such that the outcome of the planning process really is an explanation and a plan. Explanation essentially is communication actions, which are mostly trying to change the MRH. And once you add that explanation to MRH, uh, then the plan that you came up with would be optimal with respect to uh, that change model. And pure explicable planning will essentially say, that the explanation part is empty. So you can wind up picking how much you want to talk versus how much you want to essentially uh, do just the plan um, without talking. It's actually an interesting question as this sort of depends on what do you think is the cost of talking? And some people, and you know, stereotypically it's been said men, don't like to talk much. And so in that, for them maybe, they would just sort of lift big, big rocks rather than just point out the obvious that this particular uh, uh, you know, path is closed. Uh, so you know, it depends on, you know, it may conject. Sometimes in fact, communication may be infeasible if it is one of uh, Dave Smith's um, rovers, it might be you know, in, in a place where it actually cannot communicate right now. And so he's stuck with actually having to do explicable behavior. And so all of these can be put together in this nice framework, expectation aware planning. Uh, not surprisingly for this crowd, you know, we do all these other plannings now by compiling it down to our happy single agent deterministic planning. So it turns out that uh, uh, under certain conditions, this you know, expectation aware planning can actually be compiled down to uh, classical planning uh, scenarios. Um, and, and you can solve it that way. Um, the other thing that I want to mention is the design part. So you can communicate. Remember again, we are talking about model following and model communication. 
I didn't talk in the model communication about legibility work until now. I will talk a little, uh, little later, but there's been legibility work in other groups, of course. Um, and then I talked about expl explanation part and the design part. Here you are communicating the model by long-term modification to the environment or behavior. And the idea here in doing this long-term modification to the environment, the usual question is you're trying to trade off one-time design cost to the repetitive explicability cost. So every time, if you kind of make the environment change, then essentially you don't need to repeatedly compute this explicable plan and you know, sort of the environment model has already been communicated to the humans. Uh, the other interesting part about explicable behavior, especially with the humans in the loop, in, and in this is sort of something that you know, is known to you as humans, is when somebody starts doing something that you didn't expect, the first time you are surprised, the second time you are surprised, the 17th time you no longer are surprised, and when the 18th time when they realize that they have all been doing this inexplicable thing the last 17 times and they start doing what you expect, you're again surprised because you have changed in during this time, you have changed your model. Okay, so the expectation, the, the point is that the longitudinality of the explicable behavior is essentially sort of the cost of inexplicable behavior reduces. If you keep showing this inexplicable behavior, this is sort of what this Bernard Shaw is saying that if you, you know, unreasonable man, unreasonable person just expects the world to conform to them and the conform it will if you just keep doing your unreasonable thing. And so this longitudinality of explicable behavior has to be taken into account to actually figure out whether or not this design task is worth doing. And so this is something that is actually, you know, uh, was in, in this paper in IRAS that uh, Anaga as the lead author, you know, Sarah and you know, a whole bunch of us are also involved. So that's the design part. Uh, there is a paper in XAIP that Sriram uh, mentioned uh, last uh, fall, which essentially does the same kind of design, but not, but without having to actually make hardware changes to the environment. Instead, what it will do is essentially the robot sort of decides to minimize its model, reduce the complexity of its model, sort of reduce the branching points, etc. And stop, even though those options are available, it will just stop doing them. And so over a period of time, basically the humans will realize that this is a much simpler model. And so it sort of becomes, in essence, a soft design instead of hardware uh, design. And it has some of the same effects in terms of making uh, the communicating uh, your model. Um, one other thing, uh, this is again another uh, new piece of work that's um, still going on in the lab right now is, as I said, explicability is something that it may not be needed if people get used to you. Um, the other possibility is we don't expect explicability um, for, for if, the, if we trust the agent. So there's this issue in longitudinal interaction, there's this additional latent variable, you can say, of a trust that the human has on the robot. And as the behavior, as the interactions continue, this trust variable improves. Perhaps, you know, if you show what people are expecting you to do over a period of time, they try to they increase their trust in you. And when they increase their trust sufficiently, you can start doing inexplicable stuff because they're not looking at what you're doing. And so, in fact, this is something that we do wind up doing in real life and it's something that robots can do in terms of increase the trust people have so that you can then reduce the cost of showing the explicable uh, behavior. So this is sort of a, an interesting way of, um, of course, again, when you do this, there is this aspect of deception involved because what is to stop uh, uh, the robot from actually doing something completely, you know, um, uh, dangerous to the humans, but essentially trust works that way. You know, you increase the trust, then people will essentially leave you alone to some extent. And, you know, we actually look at this uh, manipulation of trust as a meta reasoning process over individual planning tasks over a, you know, a longer horizon. So that's sort of an interesting thing to look at too. Um, and then I want to touch upon the initial estimate of MRH. How do you get that? I want to just quickly sort of point out the pieces of work that we have done and others have done that might be helpful there. As I said, in some cases, 
human and AI agent might start with the same shared model. That was the case in the USAR scenario, uh, the search and rescue scenario. But even if the robot doesn't know the model with certainty, it might sometimes have multiple possible models. And, and you can then deal with multiple possible models and try to be explicable or provide multiple explanations that are consistent with multiple possible models. There's a paper in 2018 by Sharath on that. In other cases, if all else fails, then the agent has to actually learn the human mental models. This is sort of a variation of learning action models from traces. And so there is some work that we have done and there's also a lot of work in the community about um, learning um, action models from traces. But there's also this other aspect that even though I want to think about this whole interaction between the human and the robot in terms of models, really you can do, once you think in terms of models, you can then do all of this in a model-free way without actually having to have explicit representations of models. And in fact, uh, some of our earliest work in explicability, as well as the more recent work on explanations, actually do this in a model free way where you essentially represent the model instead of representing the model you kind of get a surrogate in terms of what the humans would label these plants as in terms of which parts of the plants are making sense to them which parts are not making sense to them and that's sort of an indirect measure of their model and so you can use that to actually define the distance metric that we want and you can use that distance metric then to actually come up with the explicable plan. So here you no longer are talking directly about the model. So this is sort of, you know, it's a reasonable analog to this model based versus model free in RL. You, the, the word model makes a lot of sense in terms of semantically, but you don't necessarily have to represent it uh, directly. You can actually get the surrogate for that. Um, it turns out while we did that for explicability, we also actually in, in HKI 2019, Sharath has a paper which basically shows that you can even do explanations, uh, model reconciliation in this model free way where the labeling is now done over not just actions, but actions plus explanatory messages. And you know, I say this and the explanatory message and look at you, see, do you look happy? So in fact, you can argue that kids sort of learn very quickly in their life that this magic word called sorry seems to get them out of all sorts of trouble. They throw everything around and then say, sorry, the mothers are happy. So that's an explanatory message that seems to work. So you could learn when to use what sort of explanatory messages from the traces too. And that's something that was discussed in this HKI paper. Uh, one other thing that actually I'm quite excited about, but I won't have too much time to talk about is the explanation, this sort of model free methods also get you to think in terms of scenarios where the internal vocabulary that and the processing that the AI system uses are completely different from the ones that the humans are used to. Um, you know, much of my desk talk, I thought I said MRH and MR are PDL models, um, which is what we believe in because everybody thinks in terms of PDL models. But it may well be that the machine actually is doing some, you know, opaque DRL, deep reinforcement reasoning based reasoning, but the explanations will still have to be given in a terminology that the humans will understand. And so we then talk about this vocabulary translation of the explanations. Uh, this is something that's happening in the XAI community and for just a simple classification task. And Sharath has this very nice work that talks about how to use the symbolic approximation of uh, opaque models to provide explanations. And that sort of connects to this vocabulary mismatch issue too. Um, what else is missing um, at this point actually? So I have this longitudinal human AI interaction cycle, but I want to kind of mention certain things that I'm not I'm kind of you know, glossing over. Communicating the model may not you know, by itself guarantee interpretability unless the human has the inferential capacity to compute the optimal behavior from the model change. Okay, we tend to assume that everybody can do that, but obviously we also know that planning is these days complete. So why do we expect that people, normal people will be able to come up with optimal plans given the model changes? Uh, it turns out that there, one way you can get out of it is to actually make it an incremental file-based dialogue where you make changes to the model based on the questions that the humans are providing to you. I'll talk. I'll show something about that, but we've done a bunch of work on that. And then second part about 
interpretability is human is actually paying attention to the communication. You are telling human something, but if they're not paying attention, it doesn't go, it, it doesn't, it's not going to make any difference to them. And this communication first has to be perceivable. So the robot can actually reason whether or not it expects the human to be able to see what uh, it is telling them, hear, see, perceive. So for example, if I'm talking to you on a radio, um, without video and I start showing slides on the radio, the joke is on me, not on you, because I am completely missing the fact that you won't be able to see what I'm showing you. So I should be able to you know, reason with your observational model. And that's something that Anaga's work actually gets into. Uh, I'll show one slide on that. And then of course, there's a bigger piece which is human is actually paying attention. That is, you need to you know, get humans to pay attention there's been a lot of work in HCI community, including some of the oldest work by you know, Eric Harvitz and co, on how to manage humans' attention. If you just give too many updates, they'll just completely ignore all of them, and that winds up being an important issue. We don't do that much about human um, attention management as yet, but that is something, of course, part of this. And then finally, with respect to this longitudinal interaction cycle, you can say, how does the human figure out whether they are supposed to be in the confirmation, you know, whether the robot expects that it's in the confirming phase or it is in the communication phase. So is it in the confirming phase and it's showing inexplicable behavior or it is in the communication phase and what you are thinking is inexplicable is signaling behavior. And it's trying to tell you that something is wrong with respect to, I mean, if you've seen enough Hollywood movies or spy thrillers, you know that the way you tell somebody something is wrong is to sort of change your default behavior that they expect of you. And when that happens, they know that something is wrong. Um, and, and so it's in fact, lines are becoming important as to how to capture this. And there's some work that we're doing um, that uh, basically tries to put these you know, in, in a framework where essentially even this idea of whether it is in the uh, conformance or communication phase is made part of an overall interpret interpretability model uh, using uh, some Bayesian account of all of this. I'll very quickly just show in you know, a flash slide, I'm already running late, actually I'm probably beyond time. Um, handling inferential limitations with file based explanation, there's a whole bunch of work that we have done, you know, especially Sharad, um, where the files can be provided um, um, at uh, different levels of abstraction and the explanations showing the files don't work can also be provided at different levels of abstraction. The controlled observability planning, which is this issue that do I, am I showing slides to people on a radio show is something that Anaga has actually uh, used quite a bit in trying to actually provide legibility as well as obfuscation at the same time simultaneously legible to your friends and obfus you know, deceiving or obfuscating to your enemies at the same time. Sometimes that is actually possible. And that's where that observation model, O of the model comes in and you wind up you know, manipulating that. There's a AAAI 2019 paper on that. There's a very nice video of uh, this robot trying to um, get uh, Anaga's attention in one case and trying to kind of uh, um, getting her to not look at what it's doing in another case. Uh, I would not show you, but it might be useful to look at it in, on, on my webpage later. Um, and then finally, assistance. When you're trying to provide assistance to some of the same issues happen, it's possible that you're trying to assist somebody, but they didn't, they will not have any chance that you actually, they're not expecting assistance because it's proactive assistance. They didn't ask for it. And so the fact that you help them may not be recognized by them. And so once again, there too, you need to reason about the observability aspects. So some of the newer work that Shatana Anaga is looking at basically has this soundbite that proactive assistance should not only be provided, but it should be seen to be provided. And uh, you know, if I might give you a, 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 like a thing that will stick in your mind, I have this story that I keep telling people of this couple who fought before going to sleep and then they were angry and they went to sleep. And then the husband remembers that he needs to be woken up at four o'clock. So he leaves a note to the wife saying, please wake me up at four o'clock. He doesn't want to talk to her because they're angry. And then he wakes up at 8.30 in the morning and there is a note uh, saying it's four o'clock uh, next to him. Okay, so that's basically essentially the, the wife 
clearly helped. And in that particular case, she helped to make sure that the help would not be perceived. But your know, robot can actually be doing it inadvertently and you want to get out of that problem. And so that's a proactive assistance. Uh, there's also a, a, a demo that uh, Kartik showed uh, at AAAI, which is actually, this we do this um, uh, assistance, digital support assistance in the context of land generation for mission planning people. And there we basically, this radar X system not only takes, uh, you know, not only provides planning assistance and provides explanations about why it suggested a plan, but if the human were to provide a file saying, why not this other plan? It uses that file as sort of an intimation that the human is expecting a different kind of plan and sort of uses it a partial plan recognition techniques to come up with a, a newer suggestion that is more consistent with the file. Uh, that's also sort of related. I won't go into this Bayesian account of measures of interpretability, but essentially this is this thing that we're trying to do to get this idea of how to convey, you know, convey whether you are in the, in the uh, conforming phase or the model change phase. And one piece that if I can get you to draw, get to drive your attention to is that human robot interaction requires open world reasoning with regards to humans' beliefs about the robots. You have to assume that there is this other model that human would have that, you know, there's something that robot is doing something crazy. And the question is how much weight they will provide, probabilistic weight they will provide based on the, the, the behaviors that they have found. There's a whole bunch of extensions about this sort of stuff that I haven't really talked about. Uh, you can do much of this model reconciliation in the non-PDL settings. Um, you can do uh, look at other kinds of interpretable behavior formulations, as I already mentioned, foils. Um, we can deal with multiple human agents uh, and, and then also, most importantly, trust and deception and you know how to tell lies with this kind of uh, explanations and so on um, that you can also talk about, but I won't go into that. I want to end here uh, and then say that what I try to do is essentially kind of give a, a way of looking at much of what we've been doing um, on, um, in terms of this one single longitudinal human AI interaction cycle, and then possibly put our part in pigeonholing our own work in this cycle. You know, I'm hoping that you might be able to pigeonhole some of the other works also into that uh, cycle. Um, and then, so that's what my aim was, and I hope I succeeded to some uh, level. And then also as a bonus, I left you with this uh, uh, thing about uh, human X AI, um, that there's all sorts of human in the loop AI buzzwords that are floating about. And so here is a nice devil's dictionary of how to figure out the difference between human-like versus human-centered, versus human-compatible, versus human in the loop, versus human aware AI. Uh, that you can have fun reading. Uh, thank you for your attention. I will stop here and see if there's any time for questions. Thank you, Rao. Uh, that was really fascinating. So we didn't want to stop you. Um, we have, uh, we should now be about our break time, but I think we can uh, steal a couple of minutes for questions if anyone wants to ask something. Do you see that they are, are raised hands? Do you see them? No, I don't see the raised hands. If you can see them, please go ahead. Felipe and uh, Wheeler, I think, right? Have questions, right? Just unmute yourself and if you- I didn't raise my hand, but, uh, but um, I have to just uh, listen to everyone else. Or if I did- it Oh, was... it was the clapping. I, I'm sorry. I thought that was I'm hand probably. raising. <laughs> And it is technology, I mean. Um, yeah, no, uh, my, my bad, but yes. Technology. If someone has a question, please, please. Uh, so until people um, think of their questions, uh, maybe something we had a very interesting discussion in the chat as well during the talk uh, about uh, the limitation of a bandwidth, especially um, when should you consider these limitations, uh, especially when you work with humans, how does that affect, and specifically, how does that affect the planning component? So the bandwidth being the communication bandwidth? So we, I think we struggled a bit with the terminology. Right. So, whether, so yeah. let, let, me, let me then ask the question. So basically, you could in principle just throw as much information as you 
uh, can add the human, right? And that the human try to make sense of that noise. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, that's yeah. basically, I mean, so that, that, that basically leads to a lot of cognitive load for the humans. I mean, that was the very first point that, you know, explanation itself can be just take my brain. So, you know, instead of your MRH, here is actual MR, just use it. And that mm-hmm. can be a very costly explanation. It's actually extremely cheap for you to compute. It's extremely right. costly to for the human to make sense of and also somewhat costly to you know, transfer depending on how bad the communication channel is. Uh, we are making right. the expectation assumption that human cognitive load is the biggest cost we should consider. And, and, and so that's why we are thinking of you know, smaller explanations where possible. Um, and, and so that's sort of built into this. It's not just bandwidth, it is for them to make sense of the comprehending the explanation. And this is why I also talked about two points, actually. One is in all of this work, basically we can't control the humans, right? We, we can, of course, we can train humans. I mean, experts, quote unquote, are trained to pay attention to all sorts of nonsense. You know, that's what, I, if you're a, a non-Homer Simpson like nuclear reactor, uh, you know, engineer, you will look at all those billion lights. Um, but the point is that most people's attention is actually very limited and they have other life going on. And so you should assume that you should pay the least amount that would help them make sense of your action. And also in really, you also have to actually manage their attention in, 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 in the right ways. And in all this work, the controllable variable is AI agents behavior, because I don't quite know how to control the human agents behavior other than by costly training beforehand. Um, which, right. you know, yeah. Right. So, so, so I guess my point is that we have this uh, problem everywhere in, in our life. Like there are mm-hmm. lots of information, a huge amount of information that is there and not everything is relevant and not everything is relevant at that particular point. And there, um, there definitely some research needed on uh, getting the right information to the right uh, person at the right time but what part of it is actually planning related? No, I think first of all, the planning related part is we are actually able to tell which piece of the model needs to change. Remember that model space search that I talked about earlier, that is still the bedrock of much of this communication for us. And and so we are trying to figure out what is the piece of the um, MRH that needs to change such that at least in theory, the human can see your behavior to be optimal. So it is certainly planning related there because what is relevant is certainly connected to what you are doing. Okay, and you know, because it needs to justify your expect your behavior in terms of their model. And so certainly it is very much planning related. The piece that we do is only about the planning related part, honestly. So that's the part that we count. Uh, we had another question from Felipe. Yeah, so I also I think related to this discussion, but uh, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I think we're discussing was what is kind of the baseline commonality in the model that uh, the agents involved should have? Uh, should they uh, share like the same PDDL actions, which doesn't seem to be the case there, or should they share at least the same kind of space of predicates, the same state space? Uh, what do you think for so this kind that of that is actually so there are two different parts. One is, I think that's a very relevant question. So much of that talk, as I said, assumed that the models are is sort of in you know, similar predicate language, et cetera. But that last one that I mentioned about vocabulary difference, um, which is actually a paper that's available, um, uh, it sort of answers a lot of that question, which is basically saying that I can explain so, so basically, if we can de- agree upon some common vocabulary that would make sense to you, some concept that will make sense to you, then I can make my approximate my explanation in terms of those concepts. Would it be exact? Can it be probably correct? No, because essentially, you know, th- this does lead to all sorts of interesting issues 
such as because you know in terms of the concepts you we agreed upon there is no simple explanation of what happened um but in many cases there is an explanation in the concepts that we agreed upon and so you would wind up translating that explanation into that um vocabulary and if you can do that that would be the right thing to do so in some sense this is actually happening in the xai um let's understand what is happening in an opaque classifier sort of a scenario uh bean came and her coworkers essentially have actually sort of started this sort of an idea called tcav which is concept activation vectors she calls it concept activation vectors but really they are symbols okay agreed upon symbols and so in some sense in the old days you know i mean i did i remove all those other things i have this bunch of slides contrasting this type of work about explainable agency to what has been happening in xai machine learning community which is mostly about pointing explanations saliency regions it's like if it's a image that you both are looking at then i will sort of shade some parts of this image and say these are the pieces that seem to be more relevant to my decision and those actually make no sense first of all i i, I keep saying that that sort of flies in the face of civilization the whole civilization human civilization was to go away from just pointing there are many many things for which you can't point to for example if you ask me rao why did you come to give this talk from the office than from your home which is basically about my you know plan that i used i would need to point to this space time tube if i'm going into the plan pointing part that doesn't make any sense and what they're doing in that case is if the saliency region doesn't make sense at least convert the saliency region approximately into the concepts that seem to be holding in that saliency region as to how the concepts to saliency uh, the pixels mapping is decided that is another learning phase so you learn the translation and you use the translation to explain your explanations and that i think is a pretty reasonable idea so i have actually been involved in some discussion with this neuro symbolic ai panel and i really believe that the whole point for symbols honestly is as this lingua franca you know all this other stuff i mean is is sort of questionable but this lingua this idea that i understand certain symbols just like you know this idea that machines don't need emotions but they need to fake emotions if they are talking to you because as somebody said microsoft uh, you know uh, the 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 paper clip got thrown out because it had this smug look on its face whenever it comes up and it comes up exactly when you are frustrated and you feel like punching it on the face not taking its advice that's basically saying that we expect emotional responses from people around us similarly we expect symbolic means of communication so two machines may never need symbols but a machine talking to a human may very well need symbols so my answer to this whole aspect of this you know um hinton's uh, symbols are but the luminiferous ether of ai is they may be what we need them you know because if you are in the loop you want to be able to understanding the explanations in terms of those so that's like a very long winded answer to you know you will wind up you know connecting the symbols to the explanations you know when the vocabularies are really different um yeah thanks thanks rao um shlomo uh one last question let's uh after that we'll go to a break sure hi rao any thought thoughts about thomas sandholm's uh suggestion in his invited talk to give up altogether on explaining certain things to people uh particularly when we deal with what he calls super human systems to play poker or to do supply chains or create schedules or plans that are so complicated that he found that at one point people's feedback and suggestions start being uh, counterproductive and their ability to understand the whole thing is uh, limited yeah so that's <laughs> that is a huge slippery slope that i completely expect to amas to get on because he is happy to slide down those kinds of slopes um he probably would also say we should cut out the emotions from the machines because those are problematic too but we are the, the reality is 
that a people expect explanations even when they don't understand okay and and b deciding that you guys are not good enough to understand is going to lead to an ai oriented authoritarianism which i'm pretty sure thomas has no problem with but i'm very worried okay so it's not like because who is to say whether i mean it's like every potential authoritarian regime in the world says you know we are doing this for your own good don't ask why we are doing it you won't understand you are too simplistic okay and you know our stupid superhuman ais are extremely narrow right now okay so they could very well be. imagine the following thing if you take fefeli's uh, you know uh, example that she wants that she repeats about this machine that made the best chess move when the entire room was on fire and you ask why the heck did you do that it will say i am a superhuman chess machine you won't understand why the reality is you are a stupid flexibility uh, every machine we are like narrow superhuman as but you have no connection to the rest of the world and in fact there should be you know dialogues that we should be allowing in those cases because a superhuman chess machine essentially killed the world uh, killed the room at any rate so right. i think again i think in general explanations uh, we have a whole bunch of work in fact i didn't talk about you know explanations can be used to tell lies explanations can be used to bias people to believing certain kinds of things um the the whole model reconciliation really there is no real reason why i need to change your model to something closer to what i really have i can make you believe in something completely different not mr but some m double dash and that will just help me achieve my ends and you know i keep saying that some of the best hollywood movies like the sting that you are old enough slomo to have seen um you know is about setting up this elaborate sting operation where they wind up believing a model that never was just so that you would then be able to get them to do something i understand that but these are scenarios all tools can be used every tool is a weapon and the fact that because it can be a weapon we should stop doing this stuff basically makes no sense to me um and so it's we do have to consider there should be at least trust issue for example in terms of what would mean to allow uh, people who don't understand narrow superhuman intelligence systems decisions to increase their trust uh, and at which point maybe they won't require explanations um but you know this idea that i know what i am doing and you know it's like the jack nicholson's you can't have explanation because you can't have you can't handle explanation makes no sense to me okay so i think it makes sense to thomas i i would completely believe that because i've heard him say this i didn't talk here yeah, this particular talk but i heard him say in other talks but that just doesn't make any sense Hello everyone and welcome to my talk entitled Latent Human Activity Recognition Using LDA. My name is Zaid Bukhars. I am postdoctoral researcher at the University of Koblenz-Landau in Germany. Let's first start with the problem. Human activity recognition is mostly addressed with supervised based approaches, which means that data sets are prepared according to predefined labels. I mean the designers of the approach don't label data sets of already performed activities but users are asked to perform activities according to predefined labels so they have instructions to follow in order to perform these activities however in reality of course we don't perform our activities like that so we are more spontaneous so another uh, thing is that the number of performed activities is not defined so when we perform or our daily activities we don't have this constraint of number of activities to perform consequently these supervised approaches are considered to be effective only when the human activity recognition task is clearly defined for example sport monitoring system they they don't also consider new activities or activities 
which were not taken into consideration during the preparation of the dataset. Therefore, we consider in our approach that the activities and their number are undefined, which means that the problem can be addressed with an unsupervised approach. We also consider that each sensory word is drawn from a distribution of activities over sensory word. Uh, so here we assume that each data sequence consists of a set of sensory words having the same length. And we assume also that each activity is drawn from a distribution of data sequences over activities. So here we assume that the data is present and we will uh, estimate the parameters from which both sensory words and activities are drawn. And to achieve this, we are going to use latent directly allocation. So what is latent directly allocation or LDA? It is a topic modeling approach mainly used for document clustering. Here we have a graphical model of LDA. I will start explaining from the bottom. For each sensory word WI belongs to a data sequence, we have an activity drawn from a multinomial distribution parameterized by the prior theta D, which is the specific data sequence distribution over activities which is also drawn from a distribution. So here we have a directly distribution parameterized by alpha. Why directly? Because in Bayesian probability theory, uh, the prior has to be drawn from the same distribution family as the posterior. We have also a word here or sensory word WI drawn from a multinomial distribution also parameterized by phi of zi which is the activity indexed by z and this prior is drawn from a directly allocation parameterized by beta. In our work we use a data set that is acquired from smartphone. This data set consists of n samples or n data sequences. Each data sequence consists of measurements acquired from two sensors, namely accelerometer and gyroscope. So the accelerometer measures the linear motion of the smartphone on three axes, and uh, the gyroscope measures the orientation and the angular velocity of the smartphone also on three axes, x, y, and z. So here is the pipeline of our approach using the data set with the properties I just described. First of all, although um, our approach is fully unsupervised, we want to compare it against supervised approaches. So therefore, we split the data into training set and testing set. First of all, we take the training set and we extract what we call sensory characters. The parameters of this phase will be used in order to extract uh, sensory characters from unseen data. So we will use uh, these characters to get sensory words, which are perceived as back of words where LDA will be applied on them in order to classify the activities. This uh, model will be also used for obtaining the activities from data sequences in the testing set. So the key of this approach is obtaining sensory words. So for this, for each channel, we take all data sequences and then we extract subsequences from these data sequences with overlapping 50%. Of course, this 50% is validated with empirical and experimental analysis. So after extracting all subsequences for each channel, uh, we cluster these subsequences and of course with a predefined number of clusters, or the optimal number of clusters is obtained uh, based on our experimental analysis. Then each or the centroid of each cluster is our sensory character. Then for each data sample, we take a pair of channels from both accelerometer and gyroscope. So for example, this is here a data sample. By taking the X channel of accelerometer, so we take also the X channel of gyroscope, and then we also extract subsequences with the same length and also 50% of overlapping. And for every 
a pair of aligned subsequences from both channels, we find or we assign a sensory character based on the centroids of uh, the previous step. After assigning a sensory character to each subsequence from both sensors, so accelerometer and gyroscope, we concatenate these channels in order to obtain sensory words. So the experimental setup of our approach, of course, LDA outputs distribution of our activities uh, for each data sequence and the activity is assigned according to the one that has the maximum probability in this distribution. We used for our experiment the dataset UCI HAR which contains 7352 data sequences for training and 2947 data sequences for testing. So I have to mention that for our experiment, there are some requirements that we had to fulfill, among which is the size of the dataset. So LDA is known to be effective when the dataset is large enough. So we tried to simulate this effectiveness on non-textual data, on our sensory data. So therefore, we didn't have a lot of choices for dataset that fulfills this specific condition or requirement which is the largeness or the number of uh, se data sequences. So in this data set there are six activities so sitting, standing, lying, walking, walking upstairs and walking downstairs. We use for baseline approach SVM with Gaussian kernel so SVM is supervised approach and the overall classification accuracy of a support vector machine was 96%. So this is the result we obtained using latent directly allocation. And in order to compare it against the one we obtained using support vector machine, we have to assign each activity index to an activity uh, label. In order to do so, we take the data sequences that are classified as for example activity 1 and we assign the label according to the highest number of samples belonging to true activity class or label. So this is the result of the approach in terms of precision recall and F1 score. So as you can see uh, our approach could obtain a very good result on almost all activities. Maybe only for sitting and standing the result is relatively lower compared to other activities. That's because for both activities the smartphone is not moving so there is no acceleration and no rotation. However, in general uh, the approach could achieve a very good result and a promising result. Comparing this result to support vector machine which achieved uh, an average accuracy of 96%. So there is 5% of difference. However, note that latent directly allocation is fully unsupervised. So in the modeling phase, there were no labeled data compared to SVM, which requires the labeled data. And this is very expensive if we consider 7,000 or around 7,000 samples for training. So latent directly allocation didn't require all these labels and could, could achieve a result above than 90%. So I reached the end of my short presentation. We derived from our experiment that LDA is very powerful on non-textual data, such as sensory data, when some conditions are fulfilled. For example, the size of the data set, the number of uh, samples in the data set, and also the number of words or sensory words in each sample of the data. For future work, we will apply Gaussian LDA instead of LDA. So Gaussian LDA considers or Gaussian distribution for words instead of multinomial. So this means that words or the distance between words will be considered. Uh, LDA doesn't consider this, so each word is treated independently. We will also use or apply hierarchical directly process in order to estimate the number of activities because so far LDA 
or we need to specify the number of activities for LDA. Of course, there are approaches uh, that estimate the number of, of topics in LDA, uh, such as Rini entropy. However, hierarchical directly process estimates this while the data is modeled. So thank you very much for your attention and I would be happy to answer your questions. Hi, this is work on Triple IP workshop from CMU and UPIT on adaptive agent architecture for real-time human agent teaming. The speakers are co-first authors, Tianwei Hua and Sidas. Our research background is human agent teaming, which is to design agents that team with humans. Effective teams come to act as a cohesive unit rather than a collection of individuals. This is especially true when we introduce the intelligent agents in human teams. We would like to understand what is needed to make AI and robots effective teammates rather than just tools. For example, adapt to human individual differences in real time and brings a better team performance. This is a very challenging task, different from the multi-agent system, because human behavior is unpredictable and there exist individual differences in humans. Um, as for the existing methods in human agent teaming, static agents without considering humans is the easiest one, but they cannot adapt to individual differences and thus have poor team performance. One mainstream is the human model-based methods, which train the human model from past human trajectories using inverse IO. They are effective if the human model is near perfect. However, the human model may not hold due to the low quality and the diversity in real world human trajectories. Our method try to combine the advantages of both methods and try to diminish the, their drawbacks. Our method is mod human model free, which means there are no human intent models involved. Our method relies on minimal assumption on human trajectories and it can be applied to real world scenarios. Um, it is based on the static agents and exemplars, which are created by IL or IL or rule-based methods in advance. And this static agents pool can be enlarged by training with different reward functions. Our method can capture recent human trajectories, recent human intent in real time um, to fast adapt to human players. And it can improve human agent team performance by measuring human policies and then approaching the optimal complementary policies. Um, this is our testbed, Team Space Fortress, uh, as the right figure shows. It is a two-player cooperative game where players take the role of either shooter or bait and work together to destroy the fortress at the center, which is an adversary. Um, there are two players of complementary roles and goals. For the bait, um, it stays inside the region and to attract the fortress, but try to not be killed uh, by the fortress. And for the shooter, it should at the fortress from behind when it is vulnerable. This requires the multiple adaptation and coordination between the two players and also considering the adversarial fortress behavior. Um, we measure the team performance by the number of killing the fortress in one minute. Um, the right figure shows our uh, adaptive agent architecture, which are composed of policy library and adaptation module. Our policy library stores exemplar uh, rule-based or IO policies and our method performs the online adaptation during the game by the adaptation module, um, which are composed of similarity metric, uh, which is across entropy, and also the self play performance table of the policy library. And the adaptation procedure are done in two steps. For the first step, given the recent human trajectories, we inferred the most similar policy by, to the human using the similarity metric metric. And the second step, we select the optimal complementary agent with regard to the inferred policy by the table as the human's teammates in the next time step. Um, now I'm going to talk about the agent library, which we use uh, for uh, evaluating this policy similarity uh, for, for the human players. So in our agent library, we have nine different bait agents and seven different shooter, shooter agents. And the agents differ each other uh, in various behavioral aspects. And therefore, uh, we get a diverse agent policy, uh, policy library. Uh, and the library consists of both RL, uh, RL agents as well as rule-based agents. Uh, and the different, like different agents uh, are, are trained using different reward structures or there is some variation in the hyperparameters that we use mm -hmm. or follow uh, a different set of rules. Now, uh, just to illustrate the point, so these are the examples of two different bait agents. So on the left, uh, you see a defensive bait and on the right, this is an aggressive bait. So uh, the 
the behavioral difference amongst the two is that that on the left you would see that the bait is slightly more conservative in its approach that it sort of enters the activation region and the, when the shells are fired it goes back to protect itself while while whereas in the aggressive uh, bait case the bait is most more risk taking and it, it sort of spends more time inside the activation region and this behavior was sort of shaped uh, using a reward structure which uh, encouraged more risk taking uh, similarly, for shooters, uh, we have uh, on the left, which is sorry. Similarly, for the shooter, uh, on the left we have uh, an RL-based learn shooter, and on the right, this is uh, a mirror shooter. So the mirror shooter basically mirrors the motion of the bait, and it uses a rule-based shooting technique, whereas the RL shooter uh, learns uh, learns the motion, and it is not really coupled with the bait's motion. Uh, so thereby different behaviors uh, are are sh shown in the environment. Yeah. We run a human experiment to validate the proposed adaptive agent architecture. There are three major research questions we would like to answer via this experiment. First, how are human policies compared to the policies in our library? This step is to test if we have already included representative policies in this library. Um, this is the assumption for our adaptive process to be effective. Second, we have to identify human policies correctly in order to improve the team performance. So we tested this by pairing humans with different static policy agents. Finally, we would also to directly compare the performance of our adaptive agents in human agent teams. To answer those questions, we recruited 54 um, human participants from Amazon Mechanic Turk. Each of them was assigned a fixed role of either bait or shooter. Um, then they were paired with five different agents uh, to finish the um, team space for this game. They need to finish three identical trails with each agent and the sequence of agents was counterbalanced between subjects. To compare human policies with policies in the library, we build a similarity embedding used the cross entropy measurement introduced earlier and plot the average trajectories of each human player onto a 2D policy space. Uh, we can see from the figure here, there are a few takeaways we can get from it. Uh, first, our lunch embedding separates different human policies well, and our agent policy is also diverse over the policy space. This observation confirms the effectiveness of both similarity measurement and the representative um, of our example policies. Second, we could see some relationships between the distribution of human policies and their performance in the head task. In the figure, uh, the size of each dodge represents the average performance of each player. And uh, the player to the left or the center part uh, tend to have a better performance than the others. We will talk about these findings in more details in the next slides. To figure out the relationship between identified human policies and the uh, team performance, we define a matrix called similarity to optimal. This means for each human agent pair, we measure the distance between human policies um, and the agent that the human was pairing with. This metric basically quantifies the degree of fitness of this human agent pair and our measurement. A correlation analysis shows that this similarity to optimal measurement is positively correlated with team performance in both groups. This finding is highlighted in the following sense. First, the complementary policy pairs we found in agent-agent self-play can be extended to human agent teams, and our architecture is able to accurately identify human policy types and predict their per, um, team performance. In addition, if we look at the time series data of human policy identification, we could see an even more interesting pattern of how human changes its policy uh, over the course of interaction. This again emphasizes the importance of online adaptation in human agent teams. Finally, we are going to compare the performance of adaptive agents with static policy baselines. Here, we recruited another group of human players and run the same procedure as before. While the only difference is that participants were paired with three adaptive agents and two static policy agents in random sequence. We could see from the bar chart that the performance of adaptive agents are slightly better than those of static agents. Uh, when you compare the orange and yellow bars, you can get these intuitions. Also, for the three adaptive agents who 
um, differ in the observation time windows they use to identify human policies. Uh, as shown in the performance figure, the longer the agent took to observe human, the better adaptation it could have, which eventually leads to a better team performance. Those findings is really encouraging for validating our proposed architecture. However, most of the difference here is not significant. So currently, we are still trying to improve this part of the work uh, by further improvement and experiment. Um, so a little bit summary here. In this research, we propose a novel adaptive, adaptive agent framework in HAT uh, based on the cross-entropy similarity measurement to identify human policies and the pre-trained example policy library to map um, adaptive policy. And then we tested this architecture in a non-trivial task in Rails so with real human participants. Uh, the results show that the architecture is able to identify human policies and predict team performance uh, relatively uh, accurate. Um, this is supported by a few evidence, for example, the correlation analyzed the um, different performance between adaptive agent and static agent, and also the diverse human policies we see uh, in different teams and over the time. Um, as for future steps, we are trying to enrich our uh, agent library by introducing more uh, policies, for example, imitation learning agents. And also, we're trying to extend the current discrete um, policy library into a continuous policy space to uh, enable fine-grained age adaptation. Hi, I'm Jean Massardi, and I'm here to present our work on active goal recognition using intention-aware motion planning. To introduce what is active goal recognition, first we need to present a bit of real-life goal recognition problems. So the example here is an assistive robot that have to determine what a person is doing and what the person intends to do in the future. In real-life settings, the observations are not perfect, which means that the robot have some noisy observation and might want to act in order to improve this observation, knowing what the person will do in the future. So active goal recognition is a planning problem with at least two agents, an observer, which in our case is a robot that is trying to infer what the person is doing and what the person intends to do in the future, and an observed agent, which is currently doing something and evolve in the same environment as the observer. In this quick example, the robot could choose to do nothing, to change its orientation to better observe the person, or to move in order to have a better observation spot. So the active goal cognition is to determine which of these three scenarios is the best to improve the goal recognition. When we first work on this problem of active goal recognition, we find some work that nearly address this problem, especially the one called intention-aware motion planning using MOMDPs. In this work, we have several agents with one controlled by the system and others with hidden intentions that evolve in the same environment. The agent controlled by the system need to act knowing that this other agent can uh, interact with him and uh, that he need to plan knowing that the other agents have these intentions. In this example, we have two cars, the car R, which is the main agent, and the car A, we can have two intentions, continue forward or turn. If the car turn and R doesn't act, there will be a collision. So the car R need to know or to assess what is the goal of the other agent A and act accordingly. So this problem is really close to active goal recognition with the main difference is that knowing the goal of the other agent is not the main mission of the acting agent. So what we propose here is to give an extension to ERMP, Intention Aware Motion Planning, in order to perform specific goal recognition mission. So first we need to introduce what is a PUMDP, partially observable Markov Decision Processes, and what are MOMDPs. So a PUMDP is a tuple S-A-T-R-O-Z with S a set of states, A a set of action, T a transition over X depending on the action, R a reward function depending on the state in the action, 
O a set of, of observations and Z an observation function over the states using the set of observation. A MOMDP is it's just a PUMDP with some part of the states observable and some part of the states non-observable and uh, which can be assessed using the observations. The Intention Aware Motion Planning Framework is a tuple that can be projected as a PUMDPs uh, with a set of states, a set of action, a transition, a reward function, a set of observation and observation function. The main difference between this framework and classical MOMDPs is that you have two sets of states, two sets of actions and two sets of transitions, one for the main agent, X, A and T, X, and one for the other agents that e evolve in the same environment, Y, T, T and uh, T, Y. Using this definition, you can represent this kind of problem and solve it using state-of-the-art uh, MOMDP solver like SARSOP or Despot. The extension we propose is to add a third set of variables in order to explicitly describe a goal recognition problem inside the framework itself. The four new variables we introduce are e.g. a second set of goals which represents the expected goals of the observed agent. It's the explicit belief of the observer of what the, obs of, of the observed agent is doing. We also add a e and t e in order to manipulate uh, the expected goal e.g. which is treated as a set of states. Finally, we have RE, a reward function that is here to uh, re reward when the system uh, infer the correct goal. As for the IAMP framework, the EGR EAMP framework we present here can be projected as a classical MOMDP problem, S-A-T-R-O-Z, uh, as described using uh, the color code on this slide. Here we have a representation of the overall process of plan recognition using the framework we described. First, the system will change its belief over what is the observed action goal using an action AE. Then, the system will act itself in order to improve future observation. And finally, in a third step state, the other agent will act itself it's at this step that the system will be able to observe what is the state of the observe agent. From that, the system go back at the beginning and the system can update its belief over what is the expected goal of the observe agent is and so on uh, until it reaches a certainty of what is the goal of the observe agent. As an example, here's a situation where an observed agent has to move on a grid and the observer wants to determine where the agent is going while limiting the number of observations. To do so using our framework, we declare two states for the observer, one where the captors are on and one where there's off, since on and since off. There is 13 different states for the observed agent, one for each position on the grid, and there's three different goals, so three different expected goals. The observer has only one action switch that moves the, the sensor to on or to off depending on the previous state. We choose a reward of minus one if the uh, sensors are on and of plus 10 if the system correctly infer the goal of the observed agent. All other variables are obvious. Here the best policy is to switch to observe when the observed agent reach the position 3. If the observed agent reach after that the position 4, then this goal is to go to uh, the position 7. The second time to observe would be at position 9 to know if it's trying to reach the position 11 or the position 13. We did two sets of experiments. The first one is a generalization of the example we introduced earlier. It's uh, trying to infer what is the destination of an observation while limiting the number of observations. 
The differences here is that the grid is larger, 4 per 10. There's 3 to 6 goals, which one with a different plane. Each plane are 10 action slungs, and we set 3 different noisy settings to see if our approach handles well noisy observations. We kept the rewards uh, as described in this example. We can see that we managed to limit the number of observations from 10 to 1.6 per to 3.4 while having a limited impact on the capability of the system to discover the correct plan, which is indicated with the convergence, uh, which is nearly the same either in active way or in a passive way. In the second experiment, we have a mobile robot and an observed agent which will perform uh, actions on different position on a grid. The robot has a noisy sensor and have to choose its orientation and position in order to observe the observed agent. In this second experiment, the computation and time is around 21 seconds for around 10,000 belief states explored. In most best policies we obtain, the robot will find the most discriminative action and will position itself near to it in order to observe the observed agent, performing it or not, first determining if what is the uh, goal of the agent. To conclude, we presented here an extension of a well-known MOMDP framework to solve the problem of active call recognition. Uh, we managed to get optimal policies uh, in using state-of-the-art MMDP's offline solver, specifically SourceOp. Uh, one of the main limitations of our approach uh, is that it only supports plans as fully ordered sequences of actions. And uh, for our future work, we want to deal with more complex work, especially with non-contextual grammar. Hello everyone, my name is Aditya Shinde and today I'm presenting our work Active Cyber Deception for Attacker Intent Recognition using factored IPOMDPs. The other authors of this paper are mentioned below. We apply the IPOMDP, a well-known multi-agent decision-making framework to the problem of intent recognition in case of targeted cyber attacks. Unlike small-scale cyber attacks, targeted cyber attacks are much more sophisticated and the attackers are after a very well-defined target. Recognizing the intent of the attackers in such cases is difficult because that involves actively engaging the attackers. And the tools, the infrastructure, and the mindset for such an approach towards defense does not yet exist. And this is where we try to make our contribution. Here's uh, an illustration showing the hierarchy of needs in an effective cyber defense. At the very basic level, you have detection, uh, which is where most of the modern security tools operate. One level above that, you have attribution, when you try to find out who is attacking you. And at the top level, you have intent recognition, which is the most difficult problem of all, when you try to recognize the goals of the attacker. Here's a detailed look at our contribution. In very general terms, we take the IPOMDP and we extend it to its factored variant to, uh, to make it more tractable for our problem. We also propose cyber deception as a means to achieve intent recognition in case of cyber attacks. And we implement our IPOMDP, our factored IPOMDP-based agent on an adaptive honeypot uh, to see how it to see how it performs against a realistic threat. A very brief background on IPOMDPs. These extend POMDPs to their multi-agent settings, and this is done by modeling the other agents in the interactive state space. Solution techniques to IPOMDPs run parallel to POMDP solution techniques, but in case of IPOMDPs, there's interactability, interactability because of modeling of the other agents in the interactive state space. A similar problem with the curse of dimensionality has been addressed in case of form DPs using factored representations. Algebraic decision diagrams or ADDs are used to compactly represent probability functions and combined with approximate solvers like Perseus, uh, they make form DPs with up to a million states uh, tractable. Uh, an example of this is the symbolic Perseus solver, which uses the Perseus solver algorithm along with uh, ADD representations. We extend these ideas to the factored IPOMDP. Here's a dynamic Bayesian network representation of the proposed factored IPOMDP. As you can see, the interactive state space uh, shown here as IS is made up of two state variables, MJ, the set of all opponent models, and X, the set of physical states. All the other variables are exactly as defined in IPOMDPs. 
To solve the factored IPOMDP, we take the symbolic Perseus backup operation and we extend it for IPOMDPs. In addition to that, all the factors that are shown here in these equations, the reward function, the transition function, and even the alpha vectors, these are represented as ADDs. And this gives us a symbolic Perseus solver for factored IPOMDPs. Moving on to the domain definition, the factored IPOMDP based agent is modeled as our defender. And we model the attacker as a POMDP agent. We model three different types of attackers, the data expel attacker who tries to steal sensitive data, the data manipulator attacker who tries to manipulate critical data. Now, a quick note here that sensitive data and critical data are treated as two different valuable assets, and hence they have different attacker types who target them. Also in any given system in our interaction, uh, the system can only contain one of these types of assets. So the two cannot coexist. This is a realistic assumption since usually valuable systems uh, are maintained this way. A third type of attacker that we model is the persistent threat who tries to gain an elevated access in the system and tries to establish a more permanent presence. So these attacker types are modeled as the frames, the different frames of the opponent agent in the IPOMDP. This interaction takes place in a honeypot, uh, which, will, which we'll describe using the state space. So here's a state space summary. Uh, we mentioned that we have sensitive data and critical data as two different types of valuable assets, and we have analogous types of decoys to deceive the attacker. So these three states contain the description of the deception on the system. The other states pointed by the gray arrows contain the ground truth about the honeypot system, whether or not it contains any real data or vulnerabilities. And the ones highlighted in red here are uh, denoting the progress of the attacker in the attack. So has the attacker found any data or any vulnerabilities and so forth. The attacker's actions are summarized here. The attacker can look for information or gather information by looking for sensitive data or critical data or vulnerabilities. Additionally, the attacker can escalate privileges by exploiting vulnerabilities. And finally, the, the attacker can take actions which finish the attackers, uh, which, which accomplish the attacker's goal. Uh, the, the attacker can also exit the interaction after which the whole engagement is terminated. Uh, the defender's actions mainly concern decoy deployment and removal. In addition to that, the defender can also inject a real vulnerability uh, for the attacker to exploit. Uh, this helps the attacker progress and help the defender observe the attacker and keep him engaged for a longer duration. The observations for both agents are shown here. The attacker generally gets observations about the existence of data or vulnerabilities, uh, or the attacker can also query the system to find his own privileges. The defender on the other hand, gets a combination of probabilistic and perfect observations. So whenever the attacker interacts with a decoy, uh, the defender gets a perfect observation about that. And there's a log inference agent that runs parallel uh, in the background. And that agent uh, gives the defender a probabilistic observation about the most recent action of the attacker. And this is inferred through logging. The dynamics of this whole system are shown here. Uh, these are a very limited set of variables which, only, which are only relevant to discovery actions performed by the attacker, but you can still see how the state variables relate to each other and how the observation variables for both agents depend on state variables. Finally, the rewards for both agents are also defined as ADDs. The attacker is rewarded for finishing the attack as soon as possible and accomplishing his objective. The defender is rewarded for keeping the attacker engaged in the system for as long as possible. Like we mentioned previously, we model three different types of attackers. So here we'll go into a little detail. Uh, these are POMDP policies. Uh, the first type is the data expel frame. This attacker looks for sensitive data and steals it. So initially the attacker will look for sensitive data. If the attacker is not able to find sensitive data, the attacker will look for vulnerabilities and escalate his privileges, and then look for sensitive data again in root directories or other directories. On finding, the valuable asset or the sensitive data, the attacker will exfiltrate it and then exit. In addition, the attacker also exits if the attacker is unable to find data for a long time or, or if there's any suspicious activity. The data manipulator frame is very similar to the data exfil frame, except the, uh, except the attacker will try to manipulate critical data. Uh, the persistent threat frame is very different. 
the attacker initially looks for uh, it looks checks if he has root privileges. If root privileges exist, the attacker will persist. Else, the attacker will escalate his own privileges and then try to persist. It turns out that our attacker models are well grounded in the MITRE attack matrix. This is a widely adopted framework in the security community, and the ones the techniques highlighted here are the ones that we implement in our attack models. Uh, we, we perform two phases of experiments to see how our defender agent performs. Uh, in, in the first phase, we have simulations where the attacker is assigned a randomly sampled frame and randomly assigned sta uh, starting privileges. The defender who is unaware of the frame of the attacker and the starting privileges has to engage with the attacker to find out this information. In the second phase, we have an adaptive honeypot implementation on which we place our defender agent that we implement. And we, bought, we, we try to evaluate its performance against a realistic threat that we implement using Metasploit. Uh, we evaluate our defender against uh, two baselines. The first baseline is the no decoys baseline where the attacker is just given a honeypot and is passively observed. And the second baseline is the all decoys baseline where all the decoys are deployed in the honeypot and the attacker uh, is observed to see which ones he interacts with. Uh, these two represent the state of deception as, as it is commonly implemented today. Uh, our IPOMDP based policy is much more intelligent and you can see that the IPOMDP based agent outperforms both of these baselines significantly. On the right, we have a cross entropy plot between the beliefs of the defender over the frame of the attacker and the attacker's real frame. So lower cross entropy values denote better prediction. And you can see that the IPOMDP based agent is able to outperform the other baselines in predicting the attacker's frame. Our results in uh, on, on the test bed implementation where we actually test uh, our adaptive honeypot implementation with the defender agent are also consistent with our simulations. We see that even in this case, the IPOMDP based agent, uh, the IPOMDP based agent outperforms uh, the other two baselines. Here's a, a quick look at uh, how the deception, the, the defender's policy is adaptive. This is one of the traces that we've taken from our experiments. Uh, in this particular scenario, the defender initially deployed critical data decoys, but through the defender's observations, uh, he realized that the attacker is of a different type. And so here the defender removes the critical data deploy, uh, the, the critical data decoys and deploys sensitive data decoys for which the attacker falls and exfiltrates these decoys. Uh, so this shows how the defender takes corrective action and has a very adaptive deception policy. Another quick side note here is that our adaptive deception policy that we get from the factored IPOMDP uh, is well grounded in the MITRE SHIELD matrix. Now SHIELD is uh, a recent development in the cybersecurity community. It signifies a move towards a more active approach to defense. And we see that the techniques that we've marked here in the SHIELD matrix are uh, the ones that our uh, factored IPOMDP policy uses to deceive the attacker and learn more about him. In conclusion, we show that the IPOMDP based agent is effective at engaging with the attacker and finding out uh, the attacker's intent using uh, deception. And broadly, you know, our approach is very different from the, from the detection and prevention oriented uh, approaches towards cyber defense. We use AI-based deception to intelligently engage with the attacker and manipulate the attacker to reveal more information. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Mariela, and I will speak about the article dealing with conflicts between human activities and argumentation-based approach. I will begin talking about the context, the problem, then I will speak about the proposal, and then the application to a cooking scenario. First, without activity supporting tasks, and then with activity supporting tasks. Finally, some conclusions on future work. Human aware artificial intelligence systems are autonomous systems that are capable of interacting, collaborating, and teaming with humans. This article is about two relevant tasks of these systems that are recognizing a human's activities and providing a support to the human. In order to recognize an activity, the robot has to construct a model of the world and a model of the human and he does it by considering a set of observations. From such observations, he constructs a set of hypothetical fragments, he does a reasoning, and he can deduce what activities the human can be performed. In this case, 
the robot the user that the man can be can be cooking chicken stew and stuffed potatoes. We also have to consider that these fragments may be conflict. So the research questions of this article are how to identify when a conflict arises between two fragments, how to recognize different activities from that conflicting fragments, and how to tackle the problem of activity support. Let's talk now about the proposal. First of all, uh, let's talk about the forms of conflict that may emerge between hypothetical fragments. These are, first of all, terminal conflict that occurs when two actions are inconsistent. For example, boiling potatoes can be considered uh, inconsistent uh, with uh, chopping potatoes. Resource conflict occurs uh, because the amount of resources is limited. For example, the necessary amount of carrots for chicken is just three, for stuffed potatoes is four, but the available amount is just five. And superfluity occurs when two actions lead to the same end. For example, seasoning the stew. The robot observed 15 minutes ago that the human user used salt, and now he wants to use another season. We can notice that terminal conflict is modulated with the future information. For example, boiling potatoes is an indicator that he's cooking stuffed potatoes. And chopped potatoes indicates that he can be cooking chicken stew. And on the other hand, we have the resource conflict and superfluity are more related with the support because the robot may alert the human about uh, these conflicts. And once he is informed about them, he can avoid them. These are the steps of our proposal. First, the agent constructs hypothetical fragments from beliefs, observation, resources, actions, and goals. Then, the robot identifies the conflicts that may emerge between such fragments. And considering that set of fragments and the conflicts between them, it is performed a local selection for determining consistent sets of fragments and in turn, consistent sets of activities. This is done by applying argumentation semantics. We use argumentation because it is a good technique for dealing with conflicting elements. Finally, it is performed a global selection for determining the degree of fulfillment of activities. Well, now let's see the application to the cooking scenario. Here we have the theory for the scenario, a set of observations, for example, that Mike is in the kitchen, that Mike has a knife, that Mike has a grater, a set of actions like chopping potatoes, boiling potatoes, and so on. A set of goals, like having dinner, cooking chicken stew, having boiled potatoes. And here we have a, the set of contrary actions. A, this means that these actions are inconsistent. For example, chopping potatoes is inconsistent with boiling potatoes, and cutting carrots is inconsistent with grating carrots. Finally, the activities. Here we have uh, only two for the sample, but obviously can be more than one, more than two. And each activity has associated a set of goals. This means that for recognizing this activity, these goals have, have to be achieved. In the theory, we also have the available and the required resources. For example, available there are 20 potatoes, one chicken, and five carrots, and the required uh, three potatoes, five potatoes, half a chicken. Finally, we have the rules. In the premise of the rule, we have observations, uh, required resources, and action. And the conclusion of the rules are always goals. Uh, for example, in rule one, uh, we have the observation that Mike is in the kitchen, uh, three potatoes are required, and the action is chopping potatoes. This uh, needs to achieve the goal of having chopped potatoes. For the scenario, we have nine rules, and we can also notice that we can have more than one rule for a goal. In this case, g 7 and also g 9 Here we have the hypothetical fragments that can be constructed from theory. We can see that the elements are a set of rules, a set of observations, a set of required rules and action, and all this part is called the support of the fragment. And the conclusion is a goal. The emerging conflicts are the following. There is a terminal conflict between fragments A and B and F and G. This is because the contrary actions A1, A2, and A6, and A7. Uh, also, there is a resource conflict between fragments F and G. This is because there is not enough carrots for both dishes. Let us recall that uh, the man needs 
seven carbons and he only has five. And finally, superfluity emerges between D and E because the conclusion, D7, is the same. However, the supports are different. After identifying the clone clicks, the agent has to do the local selection and the global selection. For the local selection, he applies an argumentation semantics for identifying uh, sets of non-conflicting fragments. In this case, he identifies eight non-conflicting sets, and these are the conclusions. With these conclusions, the agent will determine which activity is recognized, and this is done during the global selection. Well, uh, in this case, there is a no extension that contains all the associated goals for chicken stew and for stuffed potatoes, as can you see here. Mm? For example, uh, extensions 2 and 4 uh, only contain two goals, uh, extensions 3, 5, 6, and 7, 3, extensions 1 and 8, 4, and the same for the activity stuffed potatoes. Well, now let's see what happens when activity support is considered. Let's recall that resource conflict and superfluity are um, related with support with the supporting task. In the case of the conflict uh, of the resource conflict, the human will decide to alter the amount of um, necessary carrots. In this case, he will decide to use just two carrots, and uh, this means that a new hypothetical carrot will be created. And in the case of superfluity, the human uh, decides that he is not uh, used the, the seasoning sauce. And this means that the hypothetical fragment E is no longer constructed. Well, here we have the new set of hypothetical fragments. Notice that E is not here, and uh, I is a new fragment. Well, with, uh, with these new fragments, we only have terminal conflicts between uh, fragments A and B and F and G. Well, the next step is to perform the local selection. In this case, we can notice that the fact of avoiding the conflict impacts on the number of returned extensions. Uh, however, regarding the global selection, uh, none of the activities can be considered completely recognizing. As in the previous case, um, in the case of the chicken stew, only four goals of the five uh, were achieved with extension nine. And in the case of the stack of potatoes, only three goals of the four were achieved, uh, in this case, by the extension 11. Well, finally, conclusions and future work. Uh, this article presented a bottom-up approach to human activity recognition and support, and we saw how uh, they complement each other. In order to recognize the activities, uh, we will hypothetical fragments, um, identify the emerging conflicts that were a terminal a resource and superfluity, and we use a, argumentation semantics for perform local selection, and for identify a, the degree of fulfillment of the activities, we apply global selection. After the application of the argumentation semantics, a, as I said before, we define the different degrees of fulfillment on, or not of the activities. A, for future work, we plan to implement our approach in order to validate the, the proposal in real scenarios and to further study the integration of activity support and recognition considering uh, the suggested points. Mm, some reference. Thank you. Hello, everyone. The work we are discussing today presents a solution that combines machine learning and automated planning to recognize in advance when the currently executing plan will have an undesirable outcome. The research problem is centered around an agent executing a plan online by proposing actions. We call this agent the user. The environment in which the user agent operates has some conditions that may allow the user's plan to be subverted, such as hidden information and other attacker agents. A passive observer receiving the proposed actions need to determine in advance that the user's plan will have an undesirable outcome. To address the problem, we show that it is possible to use the characteristics of a planning problem representation to learn when to intervene. We define a new recognition problem called unhelpful plan prefix recognition. 
which we leverage to intervene when an agent is executing a plan that will have an undesirable outcome. Intervention is defined for an intervention episode that looks like this. The domain contains three agents, a user, a competitor and one observer who is the intervening agent. In this episode, the user and the competitor compete to spell words. The user's goal D is to spell band. The competitor's goal U is to spell the word brand. The competitor has a hidden block R which he uses to subvert the user. Next, both the user and the competitor take turns in proposing actions to the observer to achieve their respective goals. The intervening agent needs to decide whether or not the proposed action is helpful to the user avoid the undesirable state. We also define intervention episodes for situations where only the user and the observer are present. Our solution to the observer's recognition problem compares plans that contain undesirable actions against plans that do not. We source these two types of plans from the intervention graph and sample plans from the plan space using an automated planner. We make several assumptions to frame the recognition problem. The observer has full observability of actions executed by the actors. The observer knows about the desirable and the undesirable states and helps the user avoid the undesirable state. The user does not know about the undesirable state, nor does the competitor know about the user's goal. The user cannot recognize the effects of the competitor's actions and in some cases, some of the user's own actions may have hidden effects. The user follows a satisfying plan to reach the desirable goal D and may unwittingly reach the undesirable goal U. The actors reveal their plans incrementally one action at a time. The unhelpful plan prefix recognition problem is Given the observed action sequence O1 to OI-1 and the proposed action OI, must the prefix O1 to OI-1 be flagged to help the user avoid U? If OI is a directly contributing action O in a directly contributing sequence, then the prefix O1 to OI-1 must be flagged as unhelpful. We use the intervention graph to extract metrics that help us identify directly contributing actions and indirectly contributing action sequences. The intervention graph is a directed acyclic weighted graph containing state action layers. The picture illustrates the graph built from the current state at the root node and the desirable state D and the undesirable state U at leaf nodes. The advantage of building this graph is that it shows exactly where the desirable and undesirable states lie in the search space. Using the graph, we extract several features. Risk is the posterior probability of reaching the undesirable state on a path that reaches the desirable state. Desirability is the posterior probability of reaching the desirable state without passing through the undesirable state. Distance to the desirable state is the mean number of edges between the root node and the state that contains the desirable state. And the paths between these two states must not pass through the undesirable state. Distance to U is the mean number of edges between the root node and the undesirable state U. Active attack landmark percentage asks the question from the total number of predicates that must be true in any valid plan to the undesirable planning problem, how many are true in the current state? The downside of uh, the intervention graph is that the process is expensive for large intervention problems. So our second technique computes approximated distances to the desirable and undesirable states by sampling the plan space. 
we use the top k planner to produce two solution sets that reach the desirable state and the undesirable state then we build a reference plan by concatenating the observations and the optimal plan to reach the user's goal then we compute the distances between the reference plan and the two plan sets using plan distance metrics such as action set distance causal link distance state sequence distance edit distance and so on now that we have two feature sets from the intervention graph and the sampled plans we use these feature sets to train classifiers to recognize actions that are directly and indirectly contributing to the undesirable state then we use the trained models to predict intervention in unseen problems the experiments to evaluate the recognition classifiers use benchmark planning domains and a new domain called rush hour rush hour is a puzzle solving task where the player moves vehicles on a grid to clear a path for a specific vehicle to move out of the exit we trained four classifiers decision tree naive bayes logistic regression and k nearest neighbor in supervised learning mode we obtained high accuracy for recognition classifiers that used intervention graph features when we use plan distance metrics as features recognition accuracy depends on the type of classifier we also evaluated existing goal recognition algorithms plan recognition as planning and goal mirroring to recognize when intervention is required if the goal recognition algorithm selected the undesirable state as the most likely goal between the desirable and undesirable states then theoretically we can intervene at that point we report the f score and mcc for benchmark planning problems in blocks word easy ipc and ferry domains many false positives and negatives occur when we use these algorithms to recognize directly contributing actions and indirectly contributing action sequences the algorithms run into problems when the plans for the desirable and undesirable states have a lot of overlap as a result accuracy for recognizing intervention with these algorithms was low that concludes my talk in this work we discussed how classifiers can be trained to recognize when intervention is needed using features derived from the planning problem representation i will be happy to answer questions if there are any and thank you for your time Hello, this talk is titled Comparing Hierarchical Goal Recognition via HTN, CCG, and Analogy. My name is Irina, and I'll be presenting the work. My collaborators and I are interested in comparing and contrasting different approaches to goal recognition in very, under various conditions uh, to see whether any of them are preferable to others in different environments. So in particular, in the past, we've compared goal recognition using the analogical theory of mind, computational model of theory of mind reasoning, which is uh, which does goal recognition in ways that we believe are similar to the ways that humans do it. And comparing that to goal recognition is planning using Panda um, in a system called Panda Rec. And what we found in that work um, is that there are, in fact, trade-offs between Adam and Panda Rec. In particular, we found that PandaRec outperforms Atom uh, when there is full knowledge or inspectability of the agent whose goal is being recognized. On the other hand, Atom significantly outperforms PandaRec uh, when there is partial knowledge or partial inspectability of the agent, so when we don't know everything about them. And while that work was interesting and made some interesting conclusions, um, there were a few limitations of it. And in particular, those limitations had to do with the model um, that is used by each of these approaches. So Adam is a learning system, um, so it learns its model from observation. And because it's learning from observation, it learns a flat model. On the other hand, PandaRec requires a hand-authored hierarchical model. 
So the models that these two systems were using were inherently different, um, and it wasn't really an apples to apples comparison. So in this work, uh, we want to do a more com direct comparison between goal recognition via planning and goal recognition via analogy. And we also want to extend that comparison to a third goal recognition system, uh, this one using CCGs. Um, the main contributions of this work are the recursive analogical goal recognition algorithm, uh, which allows us to turn Atom into something um, that can use a hierarchical underlying model that is given to it. Um, this is, we also have the first comparative valuation of HTN-based and CCG-based goal recognition. Uh, we don't think that this has been done in the past. Uh, we provide valuation characterization of performance of the three systems um, and discuss the trade-offs between them. The domain that we use is farming in Minecraft. Uh, Minecraft is a computer game um, that has been made open source for AI research. Um, within the game, we make a 128 by 128 grid environment. It is a grid, grid world. Uh, we place a 5x5 five five farm area in the center and we randomly scatter resources around the perimeter of that farm. Uh, we then place a Minecraft agent into that environment. Um, and this agent uh, explores the environment when it first enters and only knows that which it has seen. So then it's trying to make decisions, um, in this case, maximizing food points, given only what it knows based on those observations that it has made. So it's incomplete information about the world. Um, there are, uh, in doing that, what it's trying to do is maximize its food points using the in-game food point system. Um, it has the ability to hunt chicken and beef. It has the ability to grow potatoes um, as well as to grow wheat and other crops in order to be able to make uh, pumpkin pie and bread. Um, so these are in-game system, uh, or this is an in-game system for point uh, for food. It has food points that are defined in the game. Um, so our the goal of the three systems that we are using is to recognize which of these high high level tasks, ch obtaining chicken, beef, pumpkin pie, potato, or bread, the agent is doing at any time. Um, the first system that we explore in this is Rager, uh, which again is a novel algorithm that we propose in this work. And what Rager does is it takes an observation, O, here, um, represented using with these, in this structural way. Um, and it checks first whether it can see that there is a goal there. If there's not, it finds a matching case in its case library using analogical retrieval. Um, and based on the case, it creates a substitution. So in this case, as you can see, the match between O and L are these select and use predicates. And so those will get replaced by the select and use bone meal task. From that substitution, uh, we get O prime, which now says select and use bone meal, and because we had an alignment between the arguments as well, it uses that bone meal as its argument. So now this is the new observation, and this new observation gets passed back into Rager. A new retrieval is performed, so perhaps this time uh, it'll match against select, use, and harvest uh, some plant and replace that here until until that higher until that um, gives us a higher level goal and that will be the output of the rager system um, very happy to talk about these details during the q a because this is a novel algorithm uh, we compare rager to panda rec uh, which views the uh, the problem of plan and goal recognition as htn planning um, and so in this system, plan and goal recognition is done by taking a goal recognition problem first and, um, and converting it into a planning problem. 
This planning problem is then passed into the planner, uh, in this case, Panda, uh, which is used to solve the planning problem. So then the goal that was decomposed to get that planning problem is the solution to the plan and goal recognition problem. And in our case, we're in particular focused on that goal recognition. The other system that we use um, is Elixir MCTS, which use the problem of plan and goal recognition as language parsing. Um, and it uses Monte Carlo tree search to do that. So plan and goal recognition in Elixir um, is done by taking the problem, um, passing it into the Elixir MCTS system, uh, which generates a set of explanations. And from those explanations, uh, a, uh, a set of goal belief values is computed, and the goal with the highest belief value from that system um, is recognized as the overall goal. So in our uh, experiment, uh, we, we, we excuse me, we reuse the data set from our prior work. Um, we give hand-authored plan libraries as the underlying model for PandaRec and Elixir MCTS, and then automatically convert that hand-authored library uh, into the underlying model for Rager. And we ensure that the same information was captured by all three models uh, to the best of our ability. Um, the input is an observed uh, action sequence from the Minecraft data set. Uh, this action sequence is typically a bit noisy uh, because it really only contains the actions that the agent takes in order to complete the goal. So for example, if it's making pumpkin pie but it already has a pumpkin, it's not going to grow it because those steps will not be included in the sequence. Um, and, so, and then the output for each system is the recognized goal. Um, as you can see over here, the distribution of frequencies of the different tasks um, is not uniform. Um, and this is because more complicated tasks like obtain pumpkin pie, uh, which is longer, requires more steps, um, are less frequent than simpler tasks, uh, which the agent chooses more frequently. The results uh, look a bit like this. Um, I'm only showing Rager and Panda Rec here uh, because as it turns out, Elixir MCTS results are actually very, very similar to Panda Rec's. Um, the major takeaway here uh, is that all three algorithms perform very, very well. You can see that this diagonal uh, here is by far the darkest color. Uh, in fact, Rager performs perfectly on three out of the five possible tasks, um, and both Panda Rec and Elixir are at 99% accuracy on two of the tasks. Uh, what's really interesting, though, are the types of mistakes that each system makes. Um, here, for example, Rager tends to confuse uh, pumpkin pie and obtain bread, uh, which are interesting in that they are similar length plants uh, that have a lot of similar actions. They include planting a similar number of items uh, and uh, harvesting them and creating something with them. On the other hand, Panda, Rec, and Elixir never actually confuse anything. Um, but sometimes they can't recognize what the action is. That's this none column in the confusion matrix. Uh, and for the most part, these are cases where there was extra noise. So time when actions uh, were missing from the observation. So the overall conclusions of this work um, are that there is similar performance between Pandarec and Elixir, despite the fact that the approaches themselves are very different. One uses planning, one uses CCG, CCGs uh, for goal recognition. Um, both of these systems were slightly outperformed by Rager, uh, which seems to be more robust to missing actions in the, obs in the observed sequences, um, and we think might be more robust to other kinds of noise uh, because of the algorithms that it uses. So the future work, uh, we would like to test these approaches on more complex data sets um, and test tests uh, on their robustness to a variety of noise to see whether Rager's ability um, to outperform them in noisy environments holds.
Thank you very much to the organizers of this workshop for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Peter Stone from the University of Texas at Austin. And this talk is a somewhat condensed version of the a plenary talk that I gave at um, IJCHI a couple of weeks ago. So if you saw that, then, um, then you already know what to expect. But for those of you who, who didn't, um, I'll be talking about ad hoc autonomous agent teams um, and, uh, and especially emphasizing where plan recognition and, and activity recognition fits into this. So first, just uh, I am from UT Austin. We've had some really exciting developments here. I just want to, um, to uh, advertise a little bit that we've been awarded a, a machine learning um, institute by the NSF on the Foundations of Machine Learning, one of the, the new um, AI hubs. Um, and it's allowed us to found a, a machine learning laboratory. I'm the director of Texas Robotics, and we recently had a, a ribbon cutting on a, on a brand new um, space where all the robotics on campus is, is going to be housed. And we have um, a, a large and growing number of, of um, robotics faculty who, who um, publish in the top robotics conferences. And so um, I hope once uh, you know, the world goes back to normal, many of you will be able to come and, and visit and see the exciting things going on here. So by way of introducing myself, um, uh, the research question that really unifies all the various things that, that I do in my lab um, is the following. It's to what degree can autonomous intelligent agents learn in the presence of teammates and their adversaries in real-time dynamic domains? Um, my research areas are uh, in where we end up publishing autonomous agents, uh, robotics, machine learning, especially reinforcement learning, and to emphasize in this talk, multi-agent um, multi systems. Um, we do both sort of foundational bottom-up kind of, of research on new algorithms and, and theory, and also more application-driven research um, on inspiring um, problems that require um, plan and activity recognition, things like um, things like robot soccer, um, where there's a, a team of, of agents that, and that need to be able to work together and also against opponents that requires um, understanding what the, the other agents are doing at any, any given time. Um, also, uh, social robots, the kinds of robots like you see here that can wander through a, a building and need to be able to interact with other robots and also other people that requires understanding and, and predicting what the, um, what the plans of, of these other agents are. Um, and also autonomous driving. I had a car in the, in the, the DARPA Urban Challenge. Um, we don't use that car anymore, but we now still do think a lot about what will happen when all the cars on the road are autonomous. We'll need, still need traffic signals and intersections um, and, and stoplights, um, uh, you know, stop signs or traffic signals at intersections, or could we have more of a multi-agent system like this? And again, if we're gonna have autonomous cars, um, interacting on the road with other autonomous cars and with people planned and activity recognition will be crucial. So I'm gonna to emphasize today um, ad hoc teamwork and, uh, and just to set the stage, teamwork as, as usual is um, something that, that people can, can do. Uh, you know, teams of, of um, disaster response um, experts can, can train together for disasters and then be able to, um, to work together to um, to address the uh, to address a, a disaster in real time, we can also program robots to to do things like playing soccer or, or you know other other tasks. But typically, these um, these agents are um, uh, pre coordinated and and trained together. So people will give the the protocols so these agents can train together. Um, there's been a lot of research on coordination languages and, and protocols. Something I introduced in my PhD thesis back in in the late 1990s, the concept of a locker room agreement where the agents could sort of come up with these protocols in a safe, full coordination environment and then be able to use it when they need to um, react in real time. So either these protocols are given or else typically the, the agents will learn or train together. Um, so you know, some work um, in collaboration with Rich Sutton back in the, um, the early 2000s, where we trained agents to, to play this game of keep away where the red, game, the red agents are trying to keep the ball away from the blue agents. Um, but they learned together as a team, they practiced in, in some sense for, for a long period of time together. So that's, that's teamwork as usual. What I'm gonna focus on in this talk is a concept that I call ad hoc teamwork um, that I introduced uh, a, about a decade ago now. And that spawned sort of a, a bunch of research. I hope some of you are familiar with it. Um, 
But the concept here is that rather than having a full team that you define how they're going to work together, you instead have to um, program an individual agent that's going to be a team player and is going to have unknown teammates, ones that are, that are programmed by others, in effect. And so this, this ad hoc uh, team player may, may or may not be able to communicate with its, with its teammates. And in, in, crucially, the teammates are likely to be suboptimal. And if they are, it's the responsibility of this ad hoc team pl player to be able to adjust. We can't just magically fix the other agents. They're going to, they, you know, we have to be able to interact with them, um, warts and all. And now people are very good at this. So uh, I can go to a, to a foreign country where I don't speak the language or to a foreign country where I do speak the language and, um, and just drop into a, to a soccer game with people I've never seen before. Um, we haven't practiced together. We all have experience, but we've never coordinated before. And on the fly, we can recognize um, what, uh, you know, how we should each best fit into to the team. And we'd like to be able to, to uh, cre create a, a scenario where robots can also have this kind of capability or other autonomous agents. So that if there's a, um, a disaster, uh, you know, where robots can be responders and I bring a robot and you bring a robot, other people bring robots. We don't have to go into a room and, and reprogram them that, um, that they can all figure out each, you know, on their own, how they should form this team. And so our challenge is to try to create a single good team player that can adapt to, um, to any, any types of teammates. So in a, uh, challenge, paper that was, was published at AAAI um, now you know, more than a decade ago, we, we introduced and formalized this, this challenge, which is to create an autonomous agent that's able to efficiently and robustly collaborate with previously unknown teammates on tasks to which they're all individually capable of contributing as team members. And so that's the crucial, you know, that's crucial. They're not learning from scratch how to do the task. They all have experience at the task, but they have never coordinated um, with one another, that part's on the fly. We have looked at this, um, you know, from a theoretical perspective uh, in the past, but it's ultimately an empirical challenge. And so that's what I'm going to focus on in, in this talk. Um, there's some, some papers on my webpage on sort of, you know, theoretical treatments of ad hoc teamwork. Um, but in practice, you know, the, the requirements of a good ad hoc team player are to be able to assess the capabilities of other agents. So that's, you know, in some sense, teammate modeling. Um, needs to be able to ass assess their knowledge states, what they currently know about the world. And uh, for this community, most importantly, it needs to be able to assess the other agent's current objectives, essentially do plan recognition. What, what are my teammates trying to do now? And what can I do in response to try to make the team um, perform as well as possible? Um, and then also to, to be able to estimate the effects of the agent's own actions on the teammates, which might down the downstream um, change their plans or you know change what their objectives are. And then you know really as I've sort of emphasized on the previous slide, they need to pr be prepared to interact with many types of teammates, um, which which who may or may not be able to communicate, may or may be more or less mobile than our sort of ego agent, or may be better or worse um, at sensing or any other kind of capability. So a good team players' best actions, this is the whole premise of ad hoc teamwork, that the good team players' best actions will differ depending on its teammates' characteristics. So what I'm gonna do in this, in this talk is, is um, first present a, an evaluation framework for ad hoc teamwork, just so we're on the same page of exactly what it means to be a good ad hoc team player. Then spend most of my time on two um, sort of, uh, you know, sort of past contributions in, and treatments that really do, excuse me, emphasize um, the, the plan recognition and activity recognition aspects of ad hoc teamwork. And then talk a little bit about some more recent developments that you can, you can um, hopefully you know, follow up uh, some of the pointers I'll provide if, you, if you're interested in, in going deeper. So I did say ad hoc teamwork, the challenge is essentially an empirical um, challenge. And so to evaluate, you know, we want to say, is this agent, A0, a good ad hoc team player? And the way um, we answer that question is to, to create a metric to, that, that basically compares is A0 better than A1 or not? 
And um, this is gonna be most meaningful when they have similar individual competencies. It's actually very, very tricky to, to tease apart um, you know, the, the sort of individual skills at, um, versus the, the cooperative um, skills. If you take you know, on, on a task, you take a player or an agent that's particularly good, they're just gonna make the whole team better, but that's not necessarily because they're better at, at, um, at, uh, at being a teammate. And so um, you know, if, ideally, if you find a way to normalize at, you know, for, their, for their individual competencies, it's also important to recognize that, that you know, you, this is only a meaningful question, is A0 or A1 better at ad hoc teamwork in the context of some domain, right? Because that they have to both be individually competent. So we'll say, you know, maybe this is the disaster response domain, which one of these agents is better at disaster response. And within that domain, there's, you know, sort of a, 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 some kind of scenarios that you could draw from. And then finally, it's also, you know, uh, can only be asked in the context of the potential set of other teammates. One agent may be very good at um, being a teammate with, um, you know, with a very narrow set of teammates. Another, you know, might be more, more generally capable. So we'll ask the question, which agent A0 or A1 is better in a particular domain with a particular set of possible teammates? And so to, to evaluate then, we can draw a random task from the domain, draw a random team um, from the set of agents, um, make sure that that, uh, that that team is competent, and then uh, replace a random agent with um, A0, replace the random agent, um, the same random agent with A1, and see which, on which, um, in which scenario, which, you know, with A1 as a part of the team or A0 as a part of the team, does this team do better on that task? And if we do this, you know, if we repeat this many times, then we'll be able to answer the question in general for this set of domains, for this set of teammates, um, which agent is better at ad hoc teamwork. So that's just, just to sort of make concrete what, what we mean, um, what it means to be a good ad hoc team um, agent. I'll now introduce um, the, you know, sort of, uh, the first sort of comprehensive um, answer to this question, which was uh, Sam Barrett's thesis from, um, from now, uh, more than five years ago, five or six years ago, um, we introduced a method called planning and learning to adapt swiftly to teammates um, to improve cooperation. Clever acronym that he came up with. I won't take any credit for this. Called Plastic. Um, so the you know the starting point for Plastic is is sort of the reinforcement learning paradigm. We're going to have an agent learning to be able to um, to cooperate with um, with teammates. But now, uh, as I said. It, ad hoc teamwork is fund fundamentally a multi-agent kind of setting. So we're gonna have um, a team of agents and um, we on only get to, um, you know, to, to control one agent, this ad hoc team agent. And the rest of the team is gonna be drawn from this set of possible teammates consistent with the previous diagram that I presented. And then meanwhile, the environment won't be just a single environment. It can be also be drawn from the, um, from the set of environments. And, um, and so we're going to, you know, combine um, this ad hoc agent with the with the team and come up and and see how this this ad hoc team agent can learn to um, to behave well with with any sort of arbitrary set of team teammates from this from this pool. So the the high level overview of plastic is that it will learn about um, previous teammates. So. Um, Basically, you know, have have a uh, a lot. We assume a lot of experience on the task with um, teammates that that are from a you know sort of a, a bank that it's that it's um, used to or that it's that it's basically practiced with. But then now it's given a set of new team teammates that it's never seen before, and it needs to be able to reuse that knowledge quickly on the fly. Um, and so. The, you know, a, a crucial aspect of this is, you know, fundamentally a plan recognition problem. It's given the new teammates that you are now interacting with, who you've never seen before, you want to be able to determine which previous teammates that you have seen before are most similar to the new ones. And then, um, and then use that to, uh, to basically determine how you should, should act. And um, in Sam's thesis, he introduces two different variants, a model-based approach and more of a policy search-based approach. I'm just gonna give um, in this talk sort of the overview that, that, uh, that unifies the two. Um, so, um, so the overall you know, architectural diagram here is that, um, that 
the agent that we control is shown in re in the red oval here, the ad hoc um, agent. And you know, consistent with the previous diagrams, it's got a team. There's an environment. It's got to control its own action. The teammates are going to be able to control their actions, and those are going to be combined to form a joint action that's going to affect the next state and overall the reward of the of um of the team. And that's you know sort of in uh, motivated by the the standard reinforcement learning paradigm. So to look at one, you know, each component of this um, in, uh, you know, in isolation, there's, first of all, there's the, the teammate knowledge is, is this sort of bank of past experience that the agent has with previous teammates. And that can either come from, um, from expert knowledge, you know, maybe we know that there are some types of agents that, that's, uh, that we can just you know, uh, give as a prior belief distribution over teammate behavior. So using the soccer example, that could be you know, the, uh, the goal scorer agent or the one that likes playing um, you know, is very good defensively or something like that. Maybe, maybe these are things we know and an expert can sort of you know, program in. At the same time, you know, maybe that, that's, uh, that we don't know, um, you know as, as the, uh, the agent designer what this set of possible you know um, strategies would be and so um, they could be you know this could also be learned through lots of interactions and again we assume that there's in effect an unlimited number of interactions with the previous teammates it's the um, it's the interactions with the current teammates that are that are sparse um, and so you want to be able to use this knowledge to co cooperate with the new teammates and then here's the plan recognition part. You need to be able to, based on your, your current observations of your current teammates, um, be able to, uh, to identify which, um, you know, what's the probability of the known teammate type um, taking, uh, taking the observed actions. And so that's a way of saying, you know, what's the, um, what's the likelihood that my current teammates are like a, t a, a type that, I've, that I'm familiar with in the past. And then once we have that, then we can, you know, uh, we've inferred our, our, um, our teammates, then um, given this distribution over teammate types, we can, and given the current world state, we can go through a planning uh, process that, um, to try to determine what's the, what's the best action, planning or a learning process, in the, again, in the reinforcement learning kind of paradigm. So that's how, you know, the, the architecture of plastic, again, the, the full technical details um, are, are in the papers and, and the algorithms that we use for plan recognition, um, sort of Bayesian updating and, and the algorithms we use for planning, Monte Carlo tree search kinds of things, the, the details are there. Um, but just to give you a sense of them, the kinds of, of results we can get, we can first of all test the hypothesis that, that plastic enables agents to, to quickly um, adapt to new teammates mates in a variety of different scenarios. And so, um, some of our initial experiments were in a bunch of different domains, sort of a camera bandit task, a pursuit task, um, or the predator prey, and also a simulated robot soccer domain. So this, this pursuit task, probably you're familiar with, it's a grid world where there's um, four red agents. Those are the team that are trying to capture a prey. Um, to capture it means to surround it. Um, and, um, and, you know, each agent is moving up, down, left, or right at any given time. Um, we assume it's a the world's a torus. So if you go off the top, you come back uh, on the bottom, and um, and crucially, just you know, one of the agents here in these in the slide is marked in it with a yellow star on it, and that's the one that we control. The rest are the teammates who are out of our control. Um, we can also do the same kind of thing um, in the robot soccer domain, and the methodology is that that our agent will replace um, a single agent on a coherent team. So we have a whole bunch of of uh, teams of four predators or you know, teams of four attackers in this robot soccer case um, that are all able to do the task. We remove one agent at a time, replace with, with our agent, the one shown with the yellow dot on the left or the, green, you know, the one in green on the right um, and test its ability to work with this, this new team. So the first thing to check is, is, is it important that our agent do different things with different teammates? And on the surface, it might be that, that an agent could just, you know, there's an optimal behavior. It works no matter what your teammates are, and that's the end of the story. And actually, that's not the case, which is, which is a good thing for, for, the, um, you know, for the research uh, agenda of ad hoc teamwork. We did an experiment that showed that, that if um, there's two different agent types, GR for, uh, for um, greedy and TA for teammate aware, 
Um, again, the details are in the paper, but the key thing to take away from here is that if we plan with the knowledge that the team is greedy, we can do much better than if we think that the agent is teammate aware and, um, and it's actually greedy. And then same thing, if we know that it's teammate aware, um, we do, and it is indeed, we do better than if we think that it's greedy um, and you know, um, when it's actually teammate aware. So it's, so it's important and it, it's useful to be able to um, model and, 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 uh, and accurately predict what, the, what our teammates are how, going to do and how they're going to behave. Um, to test the ability to cooperate with unknown teammates um, in collaboration with, with um, Avi Rosenfeld and Sarit Krauss, we co collected a whole bunch of um, teams from, you know, that students programmed as coherent teams um, and for this predator prey domain. So I think we had like 30 or so. And then we could train our agent to behave well with 29 of them and then just hold out um, and see how it would do with a team that had never seen before. And, um, and so the graph here shows that if we just match and you know, do what the team, uh, what you know, the, the, uh, the agent did in the original, um, as, as it was programmed by the students who created the team, um, it actually doesn't do as well as if we learn to behave optimally given what our teammates are doing. That's not so surprising. Um, if we do planning using uh, a form of Monte Carlo tree search, with the true known model, that's sort of an upper bound of, um, of how well we, we could do. But if we learn um, uh, you know, how to behave um, only against the, the, you know, our current teammates, this, that's shows in red. If we learn to behave well with the 29 other teams but never get to see our current teammates, that's how we do in the green um, bar here. And it's you know, almost, uh, almost as well. There's no sort of you know, statistical difference there, which is that's what we're striving for, that we can learn with previous teammates that are different from the ones we're testing. We can also look um, if, uh, if there's partially observed teammates, if we only have a small amount of, of experience, um, you know, not, uh, not no experience with these teammates, but a small amount of experience, um, and we're able to show that, that, uh, that, that using transfer learning is able to, to speed up our, our performance in this case. Um, so just br briefly, and that, that was sort of our original you know, treatment, then there's also, th what, that can be, plastic can be sort of described as a form of type-based modeling because we are um, trying to recognize uh, the, the type of our teammates, either you know, what their capabilities are or what they're currently doing now, so that can be generalized into this sort of you know, type-based methodology, which was also introduced and studied um, by Stefano Albrecht and Ramar Mamurti. Um, the you know, sort of uh, the diagram here is, and it, you know, this also applies to, to plastic, is that you have, um, you have our agent, and then there's the, you know, the, the current, the, the, the teammates, and you wanna to try to update your belief of how those teammates are behaving um, based on the actions that they're taking. And then we can plan our own action. So, um, so this, is, this is great. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's sort of, it, it works well, um, but it has a limitation. And this was you know, not addressed uh, by, um, by Sam Barrett's thesis, uh, which is that, it, uh, that this doesn't recognize parameters in types. You might have you know, sort of a hierarchical organization of types like the, you know, the offensive oriented player and the defensive oriented player, but then each of them has parameters like their speed or, um, or you know, strength of, of uh, shooting or something like that, of the, shooting the ball. And so um, in some, uh, some work led by St Stefano Albrecht, we looked at a method to try to um, look at the history and basically not only uh, model and recognize the, the type of a player, but also the parameters within those types. I don't have time to go into this um, in full, full detail, but the goal was to keep the black box nature of the types um, and to work with any continuous parameters. So we don't, you know, we don't need to know the programming area, you know, the, the programming details of how these agents work, they're just given to us, but we want to model them as having some parameterization. And so, um, so in this case, we can, we can maintain a parameter estimate for each of the, um, for each of the different types. And then um, you have to address with, we have to address two technical challenges. First, um, you know, we, for any given type, 
given the observed actions of our teammates, we want to try to come up with the most uh, the most likely parameters for that um, for that agent's behavior. So we need sort of a general efficient estimation method that can deal with continuous um, continuous parameters. And then also sort of the interesting um, addition here is that that by um, when you change the parameters of you know your most likely estimate of the parameters type, that could also affect um, how likely it is that the agent is that type in the first place. And so you have to sort of you know it can depend on the whole history of observations um, and parameter values. And so um, so we introduced in this work an efficient way of deciding which types to update and and um, and how to uh, to update them. You know, with the key being um, for each type deciding which. Uh, you know, which type to, to update based on a new observation of a teammate action, and then how to update the, um, the parameters. And we do this using a Bayesian update um, kind of method. We you know, continually up, uh, update the probability that an agent would um, take an action, the action that we observed, given the history of um, all its past actions, um, the current type that we model that agent as being, and the um, the parameters that we think are likely for that uh, for that type, and so you know, illustrated here on the right, um, you know, we might say that if the agent is of type um, uh, of type you know blue type, then um, here are the you know sort of uh, likely the, the probability that it is this this type if it were one of these different parameters, similar for the for the other types. And for any kind of for any update we get, we want to sort of update where we are on this um, on this surface. Um, just in interest of time, um, I'm going to going to skip over some some details here. There are different ways to um, to select which types to update based on the um, uh, the current observation of your agent's activities. Um, and, uh, and we use you know, sort of a, um, a Bayesian posterior selection kind of method and also a, a, more, a method more motivated by K-armed bandits um, and, uh, and evaluate the, um, the two of those in our, in our experiments. Um, in the experiments, we introduced a, um, a, a new domain for, um, for ad hoc teamwork called level-based foraging where we have two different agents, the blue agent and the red agent. Um, the blue one is our agent. And um, there's a bunch of tasks shown in the boxes here that need to be executed and they have a difficulty. And an agent can only execute a task if its skill level shown in you know, the number that's given inside its uh, circle is greater than that uh, the task difficulty. Otherwise it needs to co uh, collaborate with another agent so that they can, um, you know, that the numbers uh, add up together to be, to be high enough. So for instance, um, neither of them can alone do the task of, of difficulty 0.58 in this case, they need to cooperate. So they have to coordinate. And then the, the red agent, the teammate has a number of different high level types the kinds of you know sort of the kinds of plans or activities that it can that it can um, that it can execute, and it also has some parameters, which is what level it is, you know what its skill level is, and what its view radius and angle is, as illustrated in this diagram. And all of those need to be estimated um, together for us, for us to come up with the optimal behavior of our agent. And crucially, the blue agent, our agent, doesn't know the true um, type. Um, so what kind of behavior it'll go out, it'll, it'll um, execute or its parameter values. Um, and so um, it needs to, to deduce those and then use MCTS or Monte Carlo Tree Search to plan its own actions. Um, the, way this, uh, the way this looks is, um, I'm not gonna show all of these videos, but just a, uh, you know, a, um, the, uh, when the domain is, is acting, our, our blue agent here has to take actions and observe the teammates um, to, uh, and then, you know, based on the, the tasks it's able to execute and the behaviors that they take, um, it can, you know, estimate that, oh, this is an agent that, that is going to just wait here for me, for me to help it. This is another, this is an agent that's going to do its best uh, to act on its own. And then um, our agent, you know, once it's figured out what plans they're executing um, and what their skill levels are, is able to plan to, to act optimally. Um, so that's, you know, that, that work is, is on estimating parameters of, of types, which is, I think, you know, a key generalization of, of, um, of type-based methodology. Some other extensions that we've uh, looked at is what happens if our teammates are not just doing you know, a single plan, um, uh, you know, so as we'd say, a single type 
um, throughout their our interaction with them, but that they might switch behavior as they go. Um, in that case, um, we've, we've used a, a convolutional neural network to, um, to sort of represent their history of action probabilities and try to identify when they change their plans and then respond accordingly. Um, so this is a paper that we presented in IJKAI uh, last year. And then um, from Stefano Albrecht's group, some really interesting work on open ad hoc teamwork, meaning that the number of, of teammates can change over time. Um, and they use a graph, uh, graph neural network based policy to, to, um, to represent that case. We've also looked at, um, I, I did motivate ad hoc teamwork in uh, as being motivated by by uh, robot soccer. You can, and, you know, typically in, in RoboCup, there's teams of agents that all work together. We have also though done a bunch of experiments, at what we call a drop in player challenge, which is essentially an ad hoc teamwork challenge um, where um, players have to uh, coordinate with one another without having ever played um, played together before. So we ask all the teams to come with just a single robot, put it down on a, on a team and, um, and try to, you know, on the fly, figure out um, how best to, you know, how best to, um, to work with that team. So they have to figure out which should go and play defense, which should play offense. And it's going to depend on how your teammates are, are behaving. And so there's a, again, crucially a plan recognition component inserted in here. And then finally, um, and just briefly, because I know I'm, I'm running out of time, um, is uh, the, there's uh, been some very recent work from my group with, um, with William Mackey and, um, and Ruth Mursky and some, some other collaborators on uh, examining what happens when we have uh, the ability to have communication between the ad hoc um, team agents. Um, and so including a paper at, at AAAI that was presented just a couple of days ago, um, the references are here. I I'm not, don't have time to give you give you the details, but basically, you know, in, in one slide, we basically um, identify a you know, sort of minimal scenario where it makes sense to think about the value of communication and ad hoc teamwork, where it's sequential, one shot, um, multi agent with limited inquiry. You can't, you know, you can't communicate freely. Um, with communication and ad hoc teamwork, and we we introduce a domain where. Um, where we've been studying, where an agent can uh, you know, either try to help its teammate um, by just uh, you know, observing what it's doing and, and recognizing what its plan is, or you know, if, um, for some cost incurred, um, utter a query and ask, you know, ask for some um, indication of, of what the agent is doing at the risk of interrupting them and then slowing them down. Um, so if you're interested in that, I point you to these two very recent papers. So in summary, um, I talked in this talk about, about the ad hoc teamwork challenge, which I think is very relevant to, um, to people in this community. It's, it, it, there's a fundamental uh, challenge in, embedded on plan and activity recognition of your teammates. Um, the, you know, the challenge here is to create a good team player. It was introduced more than a decade ago as a, as a challenge problem. There's been contributions in both theory and experiments and also looking at flexible types and communication as I talked about briefly here. Um, of course, there's a lot of related work on uh, multi-agent systems and, uh, and teammate modeling, um, human, human aware uh, robot teams. Um, there's a survey that, that I did with Stefano Albrecht on agents modeling other agents that that's, you know, has, goes into a lot of detail on, on a lot of the, the related work. So um, just to conclude, yeah, a reminder that this fits in. This is one of the things we work on in, in my lab. It's the focus you know, towards this high level uh, research question that, that we focus on in general. Um, I focus today on, on ad hoc teamwork. And just, I should say, you know, the, the main work that I talked about um, was the work of Sam Barrett and Stefano Elbrook. They're, they're the ones who, who led it. Um, I also talked about some other, uh, some of the work of, of some of the other members of, of my group. Um, there's you know, other collaborators involved and thanks also to, to many of the other um, past and, and present students in, my, in the Learning Agents Research Group and of course, all of the, all of the funders. So um, with that, I thank you for your attention. I'll be, be more than happy to, um, to answer any questions you might have. Thanks. I should say I, have, uh, I was able to keep up with the chat during the talk, but um, now, that, now that we're back to live, I know there's messages flying by and I'm not a, I haven't looked at them unless, unless there's something I should read there and respond to.
Uh, we have two different people, three different people with their hands up, and I am not sure. I think Michael was certainly the third, but I don't know which, what order people put their hands up. I spoke a lot today, so I'll, I'll yield to Evan first and then. Okay, there you go. Okay, so, so maybe I, if it's okay, then I chime in. Hi, thank you. It was a really, really great talk. Um, I'm wondering, have you have you looked at um, introducing people in the whole thing, or or looking at well agents that might or might not behave relatively randomly at some point, and what would then your your agent actually do to yeah maybe mitigate the situation, or I mean if if you suddenly feel okay just adapting to something doesn't really do it. Yeah. So there's nothing in the ad hoc teamwork formulation that prevents the other teammates from being people. And in fact, you know, uh, in some sense, it's very motivated by the, uh, the sense, you know, the idea that people are generally suboptimal and, you know, you can um, and you need to be able to adapt to them. So, um, but yeah, so in fact, some, um, some work also that I didn't, didn't talk about with um, uh, that, that Ryuth has also been involved in is, is we've been looking a lot at, um, a robot and a person passing each other in a hallway, um, and mm -hmm. you know what? What is the you know what does it take for a for a, the robot to be able to predict where the person is going to go, um, and also what can the robot do to make it more predictable so the person can see what the robot's going to do? Um, and so this is sort of you know uh, it's a teamwork setting. They both want to pass each other, and um, and the robot needs to be able to be prepared to interact with any. Uh, any person that comes by and there's going to be a lot of different behaviors and it might even be different in different, you know, hemispheres, what, depending on whether the cars drive on the left or drive on the right or those kinds of things. So, so yeah, I mean, I think um, it's been easier for us to study just from a, you know, experimental and methodological point of view, um, ad hoc teamwork where the teammates are all agents, uh, you know, autonomous agents. Um, but there's, there's nothing in principle that pre prevents it from being, you know, being people as well. And, and certainly, you know, that, as I said, a, a core part of ad hoc teamwork is modeling, um, you know, and, and predicting what the, you know, the plan and recognizing the plan of the other agent. Presumably knowing that the other agent is a person will be one of the first order bits, you know, for helping you predict what they're going to do, you know, because people will behave differently from, um, from other autonomous agents. So in, in the traffic scenario, which has generated a bunch of discussion in the chat, I think, you know, it would absolutely make a difference to know whether it's an autonomous car or a human driven car that you're trying to, you know, currently, ne you know, negotiate a, a, a yeah. space with. Um, and, uh, and, you know, so I think that's, but, but, you know, the ad hoc, the, the concept of ad hoc teamwork is, is um, definitely extends to, to both. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, so from, from my experience, if you, if you really want to mess up the life of your, of your agent, of your robot, whatever, then you just add people to the equation. Then. Yeah, people are a pain. <laughs> you personally, <laughs> exactly. So, no, but uh, thanks, yeah. I, uh, yeah, thank you. Okay, so, uh, so if you mentioned that in the talk, I apologize beforehand, much like uh, driving, while I think I'm good at uh, multitasking, I might not have been <laughs> so good while I was uh, chatting away. Uh, but but one of the 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 kind of it seems like one of the assumptions there is that there is only one agent that is the guy who is who is uh, uh, kind of yielding to improve team behavior. Right? There is this agent that is trying to learn what the others are doing to best fit in, right? Or, or did you try some situation where all of the agents are basically trying? To, to adapt themselves to, to the team? And won't that kind of lead to this kind of game theoretic situations where you know, everyone tries to, to be nice to the other and then it ends up being uh, a, a mess of a situation? I, I don't know if you mentioned that, but... Uh, that... Yeah, so, I, I mean, I think there's, uh, I didn't mention that. And, and you know, I think that um, ad hoc teamwork is sort of a, you know, an umbrella concept that's got room for lots and lots of different PhD theses. And, you know, the ones that, the stuff I talked about um, today was with a single agent where it's, where all the others are sort of, you know, uh, fixed in their behavior. 
um, and only one is be able to adapt and there was no communication and, and that sort of thing. And now, you know, now we are looking at adding in communication, but certainly, yes, you, you need to, we have looked at some cases where the other agents are also adaptive in, in some sense and, you know, maybe adaptive in a limited way. Um, I, I try to steer away from the situation where they're all behaving the same. That's sort of teamwork as usual. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of people have looked at this. Well, what if, you know, what if all the agents were doing the same thing? I think in ad hoc teamwork, we, you know, it's, it's, it's more is, is where you're more likely to come across the, the, the scenarios where, um, you know, they might be learning and they might be, you know, adapting, but they're probably not using the same algorithm that you are. And certainly, you know, you ch changing the algorithm of your, of your agent won't cause the other one to, um, but it's, it's absolutely like, you know, in, in the general setting, and this is something we haven't really explored much, but, but I think, you know, the, a really good first cut behavior for an ad hoc team agent is to test whether the, um, whether the agents are learning anything from you. Um, and if they are, then, you know, then, you know, it, it makes sense to, to try to teach them that if I say this word, then that, that will tell you, you know, you'll be able to predict what I'm going to do next or, you know, if I turn on a turn signal, you'll know which direction I'm going to go or something like that. On the other hand, if they're, you know, if when I do that, they don't react, then I need to try to just, you know, um, so, you know, sort of uh, merge into what they're doing. But, you know, the, the, um, the, the whole activity recognition, plan recognition aspect, I think, you know, that another thing that's important to recognize is whether the other agent is learning and how they're learning. And then that can absolutely impact um, you know, to what extent over the period of time you should, you know, you should try to influence their future behaviors. There was a paper by Doran Chakraborty of, uh, in my lab who was looking at, at that aspect where we assume that the other agent is a sort of a memory bounded agent, that it, that it will do the optimal thing based on its past and interactions with you. Then there's scenarios where you can sort of train it by, you know, uh, having it expect what you're going to do so that now you can, you know, um, get into a scenario where it will be more predictable and you're, you'll be more predictable in the future. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I have a question. I don't know whether I'm in the line or not. Uh, Rao, I think Michael's next. Okay, good. And then you're after Michael. All right. I'll try to leave you some. I, I would uh, thank you, Peter, for a great talk. Uh, I would like to take you back to Chris's question and ask whether your answer, answer will change if uh, the Asian uh, the Asian have symbolic planning like model and you actually know them. So, which was back to the question of um... of, uh, of recognizing recognizing the behavior and estimating evaluating that behavior. Right, so, right? so don't let's say you know that uh, uh, the agent is an optimal agent, you know this, uh, this model that he has, right? And yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that, that does change anything. I, th I think the, you know- I mean, You have in, important in the... information, basically, right? You know exactly- Well, if, if you have, yeah, if you have perfect information, then it's, um... Well, it's not yeah, that, that's well, sort of a, that's sort of a degenerate case. I mean, it is still it could still be ad hoc teamwork, and we have looked at cases where you you know what the others are going to do, and you're you're then it becomes a planning problem. Then there's no plan or activity recognition aspect of it. Then the planning aspect dominates, and it's you know okay. given what I know the other agent is going to do, what should I do to you know again maximize our team performance? But you know, so, okay, so that, that's sort of a, adaptation. Okay, minor adaptation then, right? You know that uh, it will. Uh, act optimally, but you will. Uh, you don't know which optimal planet will actually choose. Um, yeah, I mean, again, it's it's. This is then. Then there could be like you know. That there's um, if if you're if it's equally probable that it could do any of these things. I mean, again, you have to think about it as as. Um, the teammate that you're interacting with now might be optimal, or it might be, you know, like, you know, there's multiple optimal actions and it's, and it's, uh, you know, and, and, and it's, you know, you don't know which one it's going to do. It'll do it equal, probably a good ad hoc team agent will be a good teammate for that optimal agent, but would also recognize quickly if it happens to be on a team now with one that's, that's not optimal and, and then probably behave differently. And I think that's the crux of it. It's not in any given, you know, I think the, the crux of ad hoc teamwork is not 
in any given team or any given, you know, with any given teammate being able to, um, to, you know, figure out what to, how to interact with them. It's being able to quickly assess what's the, what are the characteristics of the team you're on now and being able to do the right thing in that case. And so, you know, I, I think it doesn't change. If, if it's possible that your teammate is optimal, you want to quickly assess whether they are or not. Maybe, you know, figure out what's the probe to figure out, you know, if this is an optimal agent or not. And if, and if they, you know, if they pass that probe, then just do the Nash equilibrium thing. Um, and if they don't, then, uh, you know, then try to figure out what their strengths and weaknesses are and act in, you know, such a way that you can maximize um, the utility. Uh, and I think the last question goes to Rao. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so Peter, I guess I'm stalking you with this question because in each guy, I put this in the chat and then we ran out of time and we didn't get to connect. So I get to continue that same question. So I was just curious um, with the ad hoc teaming. Um, I mean, I missed the first part of today's talk, but you know, I, I'm thinking with respect to the Ichikai talk as well as the rest of the talk I heard here. So I was wondering whether many of these techniques are even more important for human agent interaction than agent agent interaction because mm -hmm. I and I think this was a conversation we had in the morning with my talk too that. I tend to think that to some extent, uh, like for example, autonomous cars on the road, just purely autonomous cars on the road, will sort of have hive minds at some point of time because we will force them to sort of at least share certain types of information. You can't force people to do anything, right? So, so the kind of work that, that the flexible, um, you know, figuring out on demand whether or not this person would be a good teammate or not that you're doing is a lot more relevant when humans are in the case uh, compared to, I guess, autonomous agents, because I think that they will be standardized, right? I mean, so I yeah, I, and, and I think you're right, absolutely. If there's an opportunity for standardization um, and, and you know, sometimes in, in like an autonomous driving case, sure, it'll be, it'll be high value enough for like, you know, the GM cars and the Toyota cars, even if they behave differently to just say, Here's the way I behave here, you know, and, and then they all know that, and it's you don't have to assess that on the fly. On the other hand, I, I uh, and I agree with people. It, it does, you know, it, it's completely unpredictable. And so, it, you know, as as I think the earlier question was also asking, the the whole concept of ad hoc teamwork absolutely applies when your teammates are also um, people and, and could be more interesting. It's just harder to do experiments and and you know controlled uh, tests and things. But I do think that as we move more and more towards long term autonomy, towards like you know, robots that are more general purpose and can um, exist for extended periods of time, that there will be more um, opportunities for or need for, for them to you know to have interactions that are not as um, predictable or scripted. That the old you know the, if if, if um, there's a legacy robot, you know, one that was built five years ago, well, it doesn't necessarily know what the type of the the you know the one from um, from, you know, that just got deployed is maybe, you know, and if, if it's traffic, yes, you'll, it'll be worth it to update a database. But if it's, you know, um, my robot shopping in, in the grocery store and it comes again, you know, up against your robot shopping in the grocery store, you know, I think we, it, it's going to be valuable and useful to have the ability yeah. to have, you know, sort no, of I, th un, I think un, not. My, my sense, yeah. So my sense is I, I don't disagree with you when, at a certain level. I think clearly right now this work is needed because there's barely any standardization. Um, but my sense is that I hope A, that there will be standardization for the robots. And if there is like a clunky legacy robot, it'll probably be thrown out just like clunky old cars are being <laughs> thrown out. And I'm also hoping that neural link won't succeed and I would be required to register everywhere. In which case your work is still quite relevant for human machine, human, human yep. interaction, but not probably may not be there as the, the need may not be as much there as you go forward, which actually also brings into open the, one of the other questions is, you know, I kind of remember hearing your talk with one of the agents being human and, you know, um, and, and I think there are certain additional constraints that do come in with, with one of the um, uh, per, one of the teammates being human, and so it might be actually quite interesting to look at those pieces too, yeah. because they might no, likely I, I, stand for a longer time. You know, right? I'm just uh, yeah. 
No, I completely agree. And, and it's, it's, it's uh, you know, I used to say, and, you know, when, when I was a graduate student, Manuela used to say, yeah, no, we don't deal with people. People are a pain. But, you know, then, uh, you know, you know it's, it's too much to, to try to figure out people. But, but, now, but now, you know, I think he, even she's also doing people. And, and it's, it's true. It's, it's, you know, you're right. It's, it's interesting yeah, no, problems. I, 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 I completely, I remember and, introducing Manuela once saying when eventual robot revolution occurs, Manuela would be actually inviting them in instead of, yeah. you know, running it. So, but I agree that. But I think we do have to deal with ourselves, right? So yeah, yeah, yeah. and and it's absolutely, and I think you know that's why I you know the, I didn't I didn't talk about, but the building wide intelligence project is exactly you know to have robots wandering around our hallways. I showed a short clip of that at the beginning. Okay. Is exactly about you know robots being able to be a part of the social fabric, and that involves in, in, in interacting with people and knowing when people want to be helped and when they want to be entertained and when they want to be left alone and. Um, and dealing with you know the the idiosyncrasies of, of different people and so you know we are looking at that uh, you know Ryuth and I and some colleagues are looking at, at the you know robot passing pers people in the hallway scenario which is is much richer than it sounds even with a single robot and a single person um, in terms of you know the robot having to be legible and the robot having to be able to understand from where a person is looking where they're intending mm -hmm. to go and and these kinds of things. And, and yeah. that's, I think, are all fascinating issues that, that really do fit into this overall you know, um, research theme. So I have realized that, that uh, as was correctly predicted, I have been a bad steward of, of the time. We are now actually 15 minutes over when I was supposed to have cut everybody off. But we were having a, a really very nice discussion. It's the and same David, problem. It's David still has a question he wants to ask, and I think that's a good thing. I just wanted to give people the opportunity that if they needed to go, you know, take a bio break or something or a snack, that they could they could they could run off at this point and be back in an hour, and we will continue the discussion. David, Chris, this is just a weak uh, excuse for not planning and just recognizing the problem after the that's fact. Right. That's, right. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. I do recognition. Of my planning skills are certainly weak. That's uh, there's no way. <laughs> Much weaker. Uh, I, I wonder to what extent you think that these agents that are trying to learn how to collaborate are actually uh, just recognizing patterns of behavior uh, versus having any kind of deeper model of what an agent's and other agent's capabilities are. Um, so I guess you know that. That, that depends on how things are, are implemented. Like in some of my work, they have a, a deep model in the sense of um, they actually, you know, we're actually trying to learn a, or, or either learn or have, um, in some of the cases, we actually have programmed in what their actual mapping is from state to, you know, states to actions. And, uh, and you know, we have several different types where, you know, we don't know which type they are. But once you know which type they are, then you have a complete mapping of their state action, you know, behavior. And then that's as, as deep a model as you can get. It's a perfect specification of their, um, of their behavior. In other cases, you know, we're just, we, if we're using, you know, trying to learn their behavior from data, then that could just be a, you know, um, an imperfect uh, representation. But um, yeah, I mean, I guess th there's no, I, I don't think there's, it's hard to answer the question because it depends very much on the implementation and approach you take to the problem. The problem doesn't um, specify whether whether the the model, you know, what what um, yeah degree of fidelity you have in your in the models that you consider for the other agents. I'm not sure if that answers your question though. Yeah, yeah, I, I think partly. I, so so if we're if we're thinking about robot soccer, for example, um, then. Um, you know, there's, there's the model that, that I could get potentially where um, I've recognized certain movement patterns among another agent, and I think he's good at, you know, advancing the ball forward, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's a deeper model potentially which, which, in which I might recognize that this guy has really fast feet, okay? And, and so I could project that onto other tasks that were not even soccer related, Right, so there I would have a deeper model of capabilities than just, you know, the sort of behavior patterns that I was recognizing within that particular domain. Yeah, I mean, 
I guess I, I, it's hard for me. I, I guess that, you know what makes that model deeper or not is is I, I guess, uh, and I think I saw Michael put in the in the chat. I mean, from, from at least the perspective of ad hoc teamwork, the uh, you know a perfect model is one that allows you to perfectly predict what your teammates would do in any given situation that that you're going to interact with them in. So if um, you know if moving their feet faster is going to be relevant to me being coming up with a better action while co coordinating with them or cooperating with them, then it's relevant. If it's not, then, you know, because fundamentally the, it's a, you know, I take the view that, that we're basically trying to learn a policy and um, the optimal policy is the one that maximizes expected utility. And um, if there's information, if I have all of the relevant information to be able to do that for the problem that I'm, um, that I'm, or for the domain, that I'm interacting in, there's not, there isn't really any um, value to a deeper model. So I don't know, it, de it depends, it depends what we mean by, yeah, I mean, you know, predictability is the key here is, is being able to, and not just, you know, predictability from every state possible state action. If I know what they're going to do from every state, then I, there's nothing more, there's no more, in, there's no deeper information that would be useful to me. I think there is, right? So there could be information about possible alternative alternatives not taken, right? So uh, I mean, that's actually information. No, but I'm saying from every state, even even like, you know, if I right. know what they would do from any possible reachable state, um, yeah, even the counterfactuals that they haven't reached. I mean, if you have the, the model, right? So if you have the possible actions and the plan, it's more information than just the plan, right? Because now you don't, it, uh, you didn't know which action they couldn't take, uh, they, they, they could take and didn't take, and now you do uh, have this information, right? So for instance, let's say that uh, you play soccer with someone and someone went uh, far away to the right, I don't know, I don't know the vocabulary, but uh, to, uh, to the right part uh, and waiting for you to pass, right? But they went there and didn't go some other direction, which they could have. And from your perspective, that it would be even better, right? But they so there's, that's only relevant. But that's only relevant if there's some action I could have, I could take to cause them to do that. If there's no action I can take to cause them to do that, then at least from the perspective of my own optimizing, you know, value, there's there's no there's no value to knowing that. No, but assume that you don't have perfect information about what's happening there. And from getting the information that they didn't do that, you get the information that that's probably not possible, right? So something there is interfering with what you would do, right? Uh, so- Okay. Yeah, that's, that's less about the- um... Yeah, I, I, I see. I, I still see it as the same, though. It's, it's that there, there's like, you know, if I if I know for in any possible situation what they would do, yes, I can do the kind of reasoning that you're talking about. But, you know, it also requires, um, you know, sort of knowledge states and, and, and you know, belief, like modeling what they know, it's not Hence just my what they question. do. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And so, so that was that was on my one of my first slides in the in the presentation. And one of the dimensions of uh, important dimensions of ad hoc teamwork is assessing the, you know, there's assessing the capabilities of your teammates, assessing the knowledge, the current knowledge state of your team, of your, um, your teammates. And then there's assessing what they're doing, the, the plans that they're executing or the, you know, the actions that they're, you know, that they're going to take. Um, but if you, yeah, again, a, mo a model to me is, is, a, you know, a model of my teammate is a, um, a representation of given their knowledge state, what would they do? Um, right. And if we have that, that's, that's, I don't think there's anything more that's, that's, you know, that you can, um, that, that can be useful. I mean, because their that's knowledge everything. state, is it could be different from your knowledge state, right? Because that's right. I mean, from your that's perspective, right. their optimal would be something else, right? But from them, uh, for them, there are two possibilities. They, a, a, it's an optimal for them as well. And they uh, chose to do something else, or, it's a possibility for them as well, and they choose uh, to do something else, or it's even not a possibility for them. And that, in that case, it could, uh, oh, it's a different situation, right? It's a different knowledge that you gain. 
Yeah, I mean, this is this is this is more about the environment. What what actions were possible for them? Yes. Um, yeah. So that's a that's a model of the environment, not a model of the of the agent so much. Although you know, you could argue it's their capabilities. Well, I, I see where you're is, going. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I guess you know, I, I was making you know a, a statement of like you know, um, but you know, fundamentally the, the the yeah, there's a bunch of different things you can try to be get a model of. There's the environment. There's the capabilities of the agent. There's the policy of the agent. Um, you know, eventually at, at some level, all of those are you know. Uh, ground out at a mapping from state to what actions are possible or what state, you know, state to what action would they take? Yeah. Well, I can imagine actually learning something about an agent where you think that um, they have a capability, but you can't actually predict the policy. Mm -hmm. right. So if you know, for example, that uh, one of your students is, uh, is, is really good at deontic logic, for example, Right. And you don't know that much about it, but you think this problem has a connection with that. You could hand it off to them and, you know, not realizing the, the details of the policy they were going to follow. Right. No, absolutely. And, and you don't always have a model. I mean, so, so, um, you know, I, I think, uh, I mean, I think also on one of the early slides, it's, you know, what it, it, a good ad hoc team agent should be able to do the right thing both when your teammates are less capable than you and when they're more capable than you. And, and if they're more capable than you, then it's, you know, the right thing to do might be to pass the problem off to them. And like in the example you just said, um, you know, and, and so you have a model of, of, you know, they're being good at something without actually knowing what they would do. That can also be useful. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it's, uh, you know, I, I think there's, um, you know, I think that the there there are many different types of of um, the the more information you know, it's always going to be about the you know the more information you can get the better is ge in general. Um, but you know it, it, there are certainly situations where you're going to need to act under uncertainty and and um, so yeah I think it's it's but this is this is you know th these are all sort of general statements about many aspects of AI. So I'm, I'm not uh, yeah there's nothing there, th that's not particularly new I don't think or unique to ad hoc teamwork. Right. Can I uh, go? Sorry. Um, so, so I just think that there there may be some some situations in which you can learn a deeper notion of capability for another agent without mm -hmm. having intermediate information about exactly how they would function. Right. In terms I agree. Of policy. And I agree with that. Yeah. So it's just like you know, this is. Uh, so, and that's actually a key, like when we've done, when we did do the, you know, the, um, when we built our ad hoc team agent for the robot soccer drop-in competitions, that would be the first thing is, is, you know, that we would do is like, you know, does that look like an agent that's better at defense than me? I don't know what they're going to, how they're going to actually play defense, but they look better than me. So I'm going to go do something else or, you know, so, so I think, yes, assessing what role you should play is one way of thinking about it. And, and that's about assessing capabilities, not necessarily about knowing exactly how they'll execute that when, when they're given the responsibility. So yeah, point well taken. This I think is a short question, uh, or I hope it's a short question. Um, uh, one of the problem domains I've been looking at, I suddenly realize has sort of the property that there are lots of short opportunities for teamwork versus a small number of really long opportunities for teamwork right one is we're going to work together for you know hours and hours and hours uh to accomplish some goal some single goal versus oh hey i've got this thing can you run over here and now, obviously, there's a learning component here, which is I've got lots of short presentations I might might be able to learn faster oh, than, than over really long, you know, the, the obvious sort of things there. Do you see anything else different about domains, about that kind of difference in the teamwork? Um, yeah, I mean, def definitely. So, well, first of all, if that was a short question, then I want to see the long questions, but, um, <laughs> but uh yeah, no, that it's a good question for sure. Um, you know, I think the when you have a, a task where there's going to be where it's going to be extended over time, then of course the approach you know, there, there's more opportunity for amortizing uh, 
information gathering actions at the beginning so that you can then, you know, um, you know, even if they're, they result in some local, you know, some immediate suboptimality that you're then going to be able to, you know, um, act more efficiently as a team by the end of the task. If it's just a, you know, these two robots have to come together to move a table and they're never going to ever move a table again and they've never moved a table, in, you know, in the past, then, you know, the, the best thing to do might just be the, you know, the average, the expected case thing or the thing that you're best at. Whereas, you know, if, if you're going to be moving 100 tables in, in the next two days with this same other robot, you know, maybe you'd try, well, what happens if I lift from the middle or if I lift from the edge, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, I think, yeah, the, the number of interactions, the amount of time, the, the length of the interaction is, is, um, is uh, definitely an important variable here. And I, I'm, I think, you know, the, the most... I, I try to push in the ad hoc teamwork setting towards the, the shorter interactions, the ones where it's, you know, that really is, I think of as an ad hoc teamwork scenario where you're just, you know, the robots happen to be in the same place and they happen to have to move a table. They didn't know that was going to have to be a joint task ahead of time. They didn't know they were going to have to do it together. Those are the kinds of things you can't pre-program or, or plan ahead for. And I think that's sort of, you know, going back to Rao's question, I think there's enough of those kinds of situations that we may not even be able to you know, just register in a database all of the different things, all the different possible agents might do in all the situations they might come up with. Of course, still point taken that people are even less predictable, but I think, you know, even for robots, that's going to be, um, you know, there's still going to be those situations. Okay, any other questions? We've now run more than a half an hour over our over <laughs> for our allotted time. Uh, and we all are supposed to be back here in 40 minutes, I think, something like that. Is that right? Do I have that right? Okay. Well, then we will uh, thank our speaker again. It was totally worth me. it. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, and then thank you, Peter. convene back here in 40 minutes. Thanks very much. Bye. I think we can start. So uh, I'm very excited uh, to have this, uh, to present this session. Uh, the session chairs will be Cristobal and Ramon. Thank you so much for organizing this uh, and uh, go ahead. Okay, so welcome everyone. Uh, we would like to thank to our panelists for taking the time to be in here and to reuse Sarah and Liz for organizing the workshop. The ability to recognize the plans, goal, plans and goals from other agents allows us to understand what others are doing. The main objective of research in plan and activity and intent recognition, as we saw throughout the workshop, is to provide uh, artificial agents with this capability, which is especially important when interacting with humans. That is why we are so excited uh, to hear about our panelists' opinions about the state-of-the-art research in this area when the acting agents are humans. With no further ado, I will let Ramon to introduce our panelists. Oh, sorry. So, thanks, Christabel. So, it's a great pleasure for us to have such distinguished researchers on this panel sharing their experience in the fields of activity, goal, and plan recognition. So thanks again for accepting our invitation to be part of this panel. And uh, our first panelist is Dor Sasadi, who is an assistant professor in computer science at Stanford University, US. Her research interests lie at the intersection of robotics, machine learning, control theory, and human-robot interaction. And uh, our second panelist is Felipe Meneguzzi, who is an associate professor in computer science at the PUCRS University, Brazil. His research interests are in automated planning, go and plan recognition, BDI agents and machine learning. And our third panelist is Ronald Singh, who is a research fellow and an associate lecturer in the School of Computing and Information at the University of Melbourne, Australia. His research interests include multimodal human agent interactions, explainable AI, intention recognition, and multi-agent communication planning. Our fourth panelist is Elaine Short, who is an assistant professor in computer science at Tufts University, US. Her research lies at, at 
at the intersection of assistive technology and social robotics, developing robots that can support and assist people to achieve their goals. And finally, our fifth panelist is Shlomo Zilberstein, who is a professor and associate dean for research and engagement in the College of Information and Computer Science at the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, US. His research interests include decision theory, reasoning under uncertainty, design of autonomous agents, automated planning, and reinforcement learning. We want to make this uh, panel interactive. We prepared some questions for our panelists, and after each question, we will allow a couple of follow-up questions from the audience. You can post your questions in the chat or unmute yourself uh, after all of our panelists answer the questions. So our first question is, uh, what were your motivations to work on planned activity or intent recognition with human agents? I guess we can start with uh, Dorsa. All right. So yeah, so interesting question. Thanks for inviting me first off. Yeah, thanks for the organizer. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Yeah, so the way I started in this field was, uh, goes back to my, during my PhD work. So during my PhD, uh, I started in the inter working in this intersection of uh, control theory and formal methods. And basically uh, what I was gonna work on was, uh, I was gonna work on safety of autonomous vehicles. So at the time, autonomous cars were just becoming a thing. And like all car companies are like, oh, we're gonna have autonomous cars by 2020. And everyone was excited about it. Uh, and we thought, okay, the only way to have autonomous cars on the roads by 2020 is to give safety guarantees for these. And I don't, I don't believe that anymore. But at the time I was thinking we gotta like provide proofs that these cars are definitely going to be safe. And, and so on. And I kind of like worked in this area of trying to provide proofs for these autonomous cars being safe. And for like a good three years, I was working on that. And I was assuming that I have this vehicle and I have a controller for it and I plan for it, I have perception, all of that. And I assumed that there are these other vehicles around me. And, and all the time, like I was assuming they follow some fixed model. So I was assuming that, oh, they're probably like driving, like whatever velocity they're going, they're probably going to keep the same velocity and continue going. And for the longest, I was thinking, oh, some, someone from cognitive science or psychology at some point will come and tell me what is the right model of the person that I need to put in. And I'll just like wait for that. Uh, and I had all these like made up proofs to be honest, right? Like, like it was made up because I was assuming made up models of how humans act. And at some point I realized that all these proofs just don't make sense unless you have like the, the problem is about like how you are modeling the interaction or how you're predicting how this vehicle around you is actually driving. Is it like adversarial? Is it not adversarial? Like how is it acting? And around like third year of my PhD, I started switching more and moving more towards human robot interaction, getting more excited about the problem of just predicting how people act and interact around us. So that was kind of like my journey to interactive robotics. Okay, uh, Felipe, can you? So hi everyone. Uh, so in, I mean, in terms of like the story, right? Uh, my first brush with uh, uh, plan and goal recognition was at a, in a postdoc that I was doing with Katya Sikar at CMU at the time, right? And the application itself was um, was this kind of interface where it was kind of a military. What? Come again? We're leaving. Bye. Okay. I have fun. Uh, this. Okay, sorry, that got distracted. I'm very distractible, as you can see. Um, but, and so the idea was that you'd have this uh, military guys issuing orders, right? And we'll try to anticipate them screwing up and telling them not to do something that would be kind of against the uh, rules of engagement and this kind of stuff, right? So, uh, I mean, at the time, right, it didn't, it didn't have that name in my head, that, that label, but I ended up, uh, uh, reading a lot about, at the time, something that was kind of incipient in terms of, the, there was not that many papers talking about that. So uh, when I started, things were still coalescing, I guess, in, 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 in calling this an area. Um, and of course, so my first brush was because I needed to, but then, uh, since then, I've been doing that quite a lot, and indeed with many of my uh, uh, 
two of my PhD students in recent years have uh, focused on, 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 on that problem space. And I think now personally why I'm, I mean, since I'm no longer kind of obliged by circumstance to be doing that, I think that the, the interesting thing about that, my motivation and my intrinsic rather than extrinsic motivation on, on, on doing this, uh, is that whenever we put uh, humans in the loop, things get more complicated, right? So much like what we were uh, discussing earlier um, uh, with Rao and, and uh, others, um, yeah, yeah, we, I mean, we don't deal with humans because things get messy and uh, so I don't want messy humans, but then it, this turns the planning tasks I think much more interesting because you have to consider this sort of uh, non-uniform noise that is uh, people interacting there. So, uh, and, and I mean, I've been through various flavors of uh, models and all of that in the applications I developed in the, the, the work I've done, right? And I think that at least in, in like the deep learning age now that uh, it's all interesting, I think it, it it forces us to think about two different techniques at the same time. And I think it's, it's one of the, the areas that I think, I mean, not going through this buzz of neurosymbolic AI, but it's one area where you really, uh, if you want to do anything concrete, you need to mix machine learning to get the, uh, information from the environment and planning to have this kind of structured way of uh, an agent reasoning about not only one shot interaction, which I think it's usually what you get in these assistants like Siri or, uh, uh, Alexa and this kind of stuff, right? one or maybe a couple of interactions, right? But uh, uh, in order for you to think more than just, you know, uh, uh, query and answer immediately, uh, uh, you have to put the planning uh, into it. So I think it kind of, uh, by necessity, you need to think about these two areas uh, at the same time. Right? And so this is kind of the setting where you can see the advantages uh, of each of these different techniques uh, um, and I think that the, so, so the whole plan activity and intent recognition kind of showcases the kind of ideal technique for each one of these uh, 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 things we're doing, right? So, so I think that that's in, in kind of in short, it's one of the most interesting areas of AI to be uh, working on, at least in my completely unbiased opinion. Uh, I could also say that I never uh, uh, I've never been too good at implementing planners, right? And just like uh, Rao was saying, people who you know can plan and those who can't recognize. So I'm just kind of uh, admitting my intellectual limitations, but that's a joke. So okay, um... thanks, Felipe. Uh, Ronald. Hi, hello everyone. Uh, hello, and thanks, Ramon, for the invitation. Um, so my work in this in this space was more or less a side project while I was doing my PhD. So I'll just quickly explain the background. So at the School of Computing, there are a couple of uh, research groups and there are two at least that I'm associated with. One is the AI Autonomy and the other one is the Human Computer Interaction uh, Lab. So the the there was a colleague in the HCI lab that is working on studying gaze behaviors in the context of game boards and seeing whether we could actually understand uh, about gaze behaviors, about people, and whether we could actually harness that knowledge to improve interactions between humans mediated through technology or between humans and artificial agents. So uh, in the advanced stages of his study, he was doing a PhD, uh, we got interested in designing an artificial agent that could use gaze information to do, do, do intention recognition stuff in the context of digital board game. So given that the project was born out of HCI lab, uh, we did, uh, there's a lot of human studies that kind of uh, set the, the context to what we, what we wanted to achieve. So we looked at how people played games, how they observed others' gaze behaviors, what they looked at uh, on, on the boards through eye trackers, uh, head mounted eye trackers, and let's say screen mounted eye trackers. So we did a lot of qualitative studies to understand how people actually do use gaze. And once we had some understanding, we, we kind of came up with uh, with a few models. Uh, in, in our case, a very simple gaze model that could use gaze data to recognize intentions of people. So we had uh, screen mounted um, uh, kind of uh, eye trackers and we could look at where people are looking at on the screen uh, and in, the, in, in games, what act they were actually playing in the game and so forth. So we, we kind of 
in it was just out of curiosity whether we could actually come up with a model that could recognize intentions and we could actually predict what they were going to do in the future so we came up with a couple of uh, models and we tried with uh, hundreds of players uh, over over several studies uh, and it, it turned out to be quite good and that resulted in in a paper uh, in 2018 that that we kind of presented at amas now once we were kind of confident that the idea was working okay-ish like in the context of games um, now we are actually uh, working on a more serious problem um, uh, which is actually helping uh, design interactive sessions for stroke patients so stroke patients who have lost uh, arm movement um, they're robotic agents which actually help uh, individuals to kind of do some exercises to potentially get their arm movement back and uh, researchers have been looking at gaze in that context for about a decade at least uh, and we have got on a, spe a kind of specific goal so my my study or my endeavor in actually doing intention recognition with with people has been pretty preliminary so from 2018 so i'm pretty new to this uh, but what motivates me to keep working on it is when i when i look at the new the, the current problem that we are looking at uh, it it we are just hoping that it translates into something interaction a kind of interesting so that it motivates stroke patients to kind of um, be be more engaged in their kind of um, in their rehab process but again that 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 the study is pretty preliminary but that's how i actually got into this uh, into this space and given the 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 final application that i've just talked about the robotic rehab it's 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 what motivates me to kind of make uh, strong contributions in this area because it's going to have, let's say, real impact uh, on, on actual people. Very interesting. Thanks, Ronald. Uh, Elaine, please. Sure. So um, I think I, I come at this maybe in some ways from the, the human side or really the human-robot interaction side. So I've been doing human-robot interaction basically since I knew what research was. I, this is what I wanted to do. Um, and there's sort of two reasons why I think this recognition problem is really interesting um, and important. So I think much like the other panelists, I think that humans are sort of an interesting, exciting, hard application. Um, and in the interest of we've all been on Zoom all day and we're tired, um, I will tell you my favorite story about intent recognition which is, um, so I started grad school. Actually, I had, I uh, went to USC for grad school. I had been there actually as an REU student. And there was this older grad student who was a mentor to me, uh, Dave Filecipher, if any of you are in the HRI community and you know Dave, um, he's great. And one day, you know, at the start of my PhD, as he was leaving, he was clearing out his desk and he handed me this piece of paper and it was a round piece of um, like cardstock, so thick paper. And brightly colored um, and he handed it to me and I noticed it was kind of it was a circle but it was sort of like had a funny shape out of it and he hands it to me and he goes I want you to have this it's very important for you um, to keep this and uh, the reason I want you to have this is this is the button from a robot we had put a button on this robot and we put this robot with kids and specifically with kids with autism so these autistic kids are playing with the robot and he said and there was this one kid who loved the robot Love the robot, love the robot so much that he went up to this robot and he decided to try and eat it. And this button out of the edge of the button was a perfect little half circle of this kid. And he said, I want you to have this and I just want you to remember anything can happen. So when I think about why this is hard, right? I care about putting robots in the real world with real people. And people are, they're predictable in some ways, but you always have to remember that anything can happen. I've had people turn off robots, mess with robots, try and cheat at games, um, try and like explore what is this robot trying to do. And so this is a really, really hard problem. And you know, when I was starting to do my PhD and the, the problems that I'm excited about, I'm like, I'm someone, if you put a problem in front of me and say, this is a hard problem, I now want to work on it, right? That's true, I think, of most academics. We love hard problems. And especially things where you're like, I have to, I have, I hope to have a career for 30, 40 years, maybe even longer. Academics are not great at retiring on time. 
So what's <laughs> going to keep me interested? And to me, this problem of like dealing with humans, recognizing what they want to do, and then interacting with them is a problem that really can, can keep my attention. In addition to that, I, it was mentioned that I do some work in assistive technology. And so I also think that activity recognition, intent recognition, goal recognition, to me is also a moral issue. And the reason for that is I am interested in building robots that help people. I'm especially interested in building robots that help disabled people to move through the world more easily. And what you really shouldn't do, and I, I would argue morally absolutely should not do, is to decide me as the, as the computer scientist, as the engineer, let me tell you what you want. I will pick a goal for you and I will have the robot, you know, do that goal. These are, when you think about, so I have a disability to be clear, so I, this is an us thing. Um, when you think about the world that disabled people live in is a world in which other people are often trying to impose their goals on you. You know, clinicians, caregivers, other people are trying to like make you do things. And what we really want, right, is for robots to be able to help support people's own autonomy, their own decisions, their own goals. And so the only way you can do that is you have to recognize the goal that the person is trying to achieve so that you can support that goal. Not a goal that a clinician told you, not a goal that you made up as an engineer, but you have to actually recognize, understand, and support the person's own goals. Those are my two, my two reasons. One, it's a hard problem. Two, it's a moral imperative. Um, you can pick which one uh, you find more compelling, but hopefully uh, that will make you excited to work on these problems. Okay, thank you, Elaine. Uh, Shlomo, please. Yeah, hi. So hi. a lot of these things resonate with me, but uh, my, my background is in planning. I worked uh, for a long time on planning under uncertainty and for a period of time working on coordination, multi-agent coordination. We developed the DECPOM DP model and so on. And then AI started to work or work uh, uh, enough to be uh, deployed and uh, certain and, and, and suddenly um, people became more and more prominent in interaction with people. So very quickly, I understood that there is no hope for coordination without recognition. Any seamless coordination, perhaps if you have two robots and they are perfectly reliable, they can be just programmed to coordinate and, uh, and do things. But it, when, when you co uh, coordinate with a person, uh, even if the there is a shared plan and it's well represented and the person is not confused about it and the model, all these things are not trivial, but let's say that all of these conditions are met, just the uncertainty about whether the person will the pace at which the person will progress along the plan and the uncertainty about whether they will be distracted for a minute by answering the phone makes it hard for the robot to seamless uh, collaborate with, with, with a robot. And, and you really need to uh, recognize uh, where you are in the plan. So this is, that's how it started, a more simple form of, of uh, recognition. And then came autonomous vehicles. So I also started to work on that. I have a collaboration with Nissan that now goes on for nearly 10 years. And when I first came to the lab, I thought that they have anthropologists working with the computer scientists on, on, on uh, the inter intersection problem. What should an autonomous car do when it gets to a four-way stop sign intersection and so on? And I asked, why do you need anthropologists on the team? And very quickly it became clear that uh, you, you need to be able to understand um, what, what people are doing, but also um, what social norms, any interaction is a social behavior. So you need to understand social norms that are different in different cities. You, you need to understand that the behavior is, well, we'll get to, let's leave something for the next question or two. So I will stop here. But um, these were the two motivating problems. Okay, thank you. Chris Abel? 
Uh, I don't know if the audience has. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Has some yeah. Questions. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> like okay. I think we can pass to the second question. Okay. Thank you, guys. So thank you. Most of you talk about the applications that you worked on, but if you want to do uh, another application and what models were, uh, what are the models that you use for uh, to model the environment or how did you address the observations? Please, um, I don't know. We can start with Ronald now, maybe. Yes. Um, so in, in the application that I just talked about, our problem was uh, a multimodal uh, kind of intention recognition. So we were trying to fuse two sources of information together. One is uh, observing somebody take physical actions in the environment, so actions that actually change the state of the environment, and the gaze actions which actually indicate uh, what could be possible actions an individual might want to take or what sort of changes to the state the environment uh, the the individual wants to make but not necessarily change the change the state of the environment so it's important to understand the distinction between the two so in uh, in in the in this in the space of let's say looking at physical actions there there are numerous models that we can actually look at and so for our work we looked at the model proposed by um, uh, Remesas and Gaffner in 2010 and uh, Vered and uh, colleagues in 2016. So we, we already had uh, a model that could look at what players were doing in the game and predict what likely actions they, had going, they were going to take in the future. So we had that model sorted. Now the the space that we needed to work on was gaze inter kind of intention recognition. Now in that particular space, there's, there was a lot of work that was done with machine learning. But what our research group was interested was not in simply doing intention recognition, but if you want to do in case based intention recognition, uh, we already know from research, just collect a lot of data. You know, if you've got specific tasks, train a machine learning model, it will do much better uh, compared to let's say handcrafted models uh, generally. But what, what we are also interested in being able to explain why gaze worked in this context. So answering that why question. And so for that, we needed a transparent model. And, and and we had to develop our own model, right? So it's uh, it's important to understand that it's, it was just one of the models that we proposed and it looks at uh, just a few of the possible spectrum of gaze behaviors. So we looked at simply fixations and what is fixation? When you look at a particular object for some period of time to perceive it, right? That's basically what you call a fixation. So we use just that particular gaze behavior to judge an individual's uh, attention. At, at a particular object. So if you look at something for very long time, or if you look at something multiple times, basically we fuse these two pieces of information together to judge your attention in that particular object, okay? That was the basic kind of thought process. How did we actually operationalize this? So an eye tracker usually gives us a stream of uh, gaze points uh, because we were looking at uh, a fixed kind of environment. So it's a digital uh, board game we knew where the elements were placed. So we could map each of the gaze points to points to the objects in the game, right? So that gave an indication of what object that individual is looking at at any given point in time. And then we developed separately a handcrafted intention model. So if you're looking at a card, what could you be thinking about? What would, what would be your intentions or actions associated with that particular object? Okay, now when you put this together, we, we have the capability to process a stream of waste points, map it to objects, and then map it to intentions, All right? So we have got now a very basic game model that, that can give us intentions or possible intentions of a player. And, and we fuse these two pieces of kind of probabilities. What's the probability of you taking an action given that you've taken physical action in the game? And what's the probability that you're going to take these actions in the future, given that you have been looking at these elements in the game. And we fuse these two pieces of information together using a Bayesian model to do to generate a probability distribution of all the likely plans of an individual, considering the physical actions, that, that is actions that actually change the state of the game versus gaze actions, which indicate possible state transitions that you might want to bring in the future. Uh, and and we found that 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 model was worked reasonably well in the context of of uh, games. So that is the underlying model that we used. Now, the model again is very preliminary. There are various 
uh, spectrum of gaze behaviors, for example, saccadic behaviors, et cetera, we haven't even stepped into actually modeling those kinds of behaviors. But having a transparent model gave us some indication or, or ability to explain things. So we did some of the other studies which looked at explaining intentions of individuals to other humans, and, and we were able to do that through, through these transparent models. Yep. So those are the basic kind of models that we have used. So the underlying model is using a base, we use a Bayesian model to fuse the gaze intentions as well as intentions through physical actions um, uh, to, 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 to recognize intentions of individuals. Thank you. Very interesting and very complex as we assumed. <laughs> uh, Elaine, please. Yeah, so um, the Models, I think I would say these days, I kind of, uh, let's say dream in MDPs. Like we think of the robot as living in its current state and we're gonna take some actions. Um, so that's, that's probably the short answer. Uh, the longer answer is that I, the thing that keeps me up at night is sample complexity and sample efficiency. Um, I, you know, when I think about the kinds of problems that I am, I'm dealing with, when I think of robots in the real world, the amount of noise you have is enormous. The number of samples you have is very small. Um, and there's sort of two ways that I've dealt with this sort of in the past and then sort of current in my current work. So in the past, one of the ways you can deal with this is like you essentially strip down your models to almost nothing. And you go back even past regress, past statistical machine learning into just like almost just statistics. Um, because you can detect differences in, in the environment just using sort of these statistical changes and changes in the variance and means in your sensor data. Um, so I've done that for, I did a, a, some work on detecting whether or not someone's trying to interact with the robot when it's doing something. And really all we do is look at the sensor streams that are coming in and we look at, we're looking for changes and we're particularly looking for changes, unusual changes in response to robots behavior. Um, and what, what's interesting about that particular paper is, so when I talk about limited data, what I mean is I put a robot in the real world in an atrium environment light change atrium with uh, skylights. So light was changing, people were moving, class changes, noise, the building was actually still under construction. So there's beeping, like that's a level of noise. I had, I took three different, uh, I was there three days and I had a total of, I think 13 positive and 13 negative labels. Like that's the data, <laughs> noise, data. Um, so that's so that's one approach to that. Um, when I think about you know my current work, especially in pandemic times when robots in crowds is not a thing right now, um, I've gotten really interested in interactive reinforcement learning. So actually using a human in the loop to learn faster, um, and we have we're increasingly finding, let's say, in our work that using a human can actually help you learn much, much faster, including learning in these kind of MDP situations, even continuous action MDPs, where you can do kind of really cool robot stuff, really cool robot stuff with humans using a person to actually help you help you with that learning. Um, and if you think about, you know, who are the real experts on recognizing human intentions? Like if you want something that people are actually really good at doing, <laughs> it's recognizing other people's intentions, especially at the level in robotics that we care about. We don't necessarily need to know that like, oh, this person is plotting to like do this thing and like the, you know, political machinations, right? We don't need that level of thing where even people might find it hard. We're like, are they trying to reach for this object or that object? And a person is like, oh, obviously. So using a human in the loop, I think is actually a really interesting technique um, that I've been really excited about. Human in the loop, learning about humans. So you have humans on both ends, uh, which I think is, I'm really excited about. Thank you. And since we are talking about MDPs, I think Shlomo is the best person to go next. Well, yes, that's the model I use. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I focus on sequential decision making. So I've used a lot of MDPs and their extensions, PomDPs and DECPOMDPs. And I know that um, many people are still skeptical about uh, PomDPs, but 
there's been a lot of success of deploying uh, Palm DPs in our case in autonomous driving, and then even DAC Palm DPs in coordination of maybe two robots and so on. So I really believe in these models. In many cases, the structure at least is handcrafted and parameters sometimes are learned a little bit from data, but there, it's very hard to gain a lot of data. For example, in, auto, in autonomous driving, if you focus on perception, there are data sets, but if you look at the complete vehicle behaving and interacting with other vehicles, any particular type of interaction is, is, uh, can be pretty rare. And there, there, there isn't a, a lot of data and data sets to use. So we need to use a combination of both. I want to point out just one interesting thing since you mentioned observation in the context of, of uh, plan recognition. We had a recent paper on what we call agent aware state estimation. The basic idea is, and it was actually tested on autonomous vehicle perception, when you get to an intersection and because of glare, you can't see the light. It probably happened to, any, to, to everybody. Uh, it happened to me just a few days ago. Couldn't see any, any, uh, anything about the light. So you look at the driver next to you, hoping that they uh, have a, maybe their sunglasses on a different angle. And you know what to do based on their behavior. We try to, to do the same thing and develop a general model where there is a signal in the environment. We, we wanted to limit it to some limited thing, limited aspect, not necessarily the entire state, but there's maybe a signal in the environment or particular feature that all the agents condition their behavior on that feature. Now you observe their behavior, you can do recognition. You want to infer the, the signal because it, it's going to uh, modulate your behavior as well. So we got some good results that way. So you can recover your own observations, the one you, you, you can access through the behaviors of other agents. Thank you. Uh, next doors up, please. Yeah, so I think part of the question, the first part was applications. Well, let me maybe first briefly talk about that. So. As I mentioned, I started in the space of autonomous driving, but I'm not necessarily doing that much autonomous driving work these days. Uh, some of the other applications you're looking at these days are assistive robotics and assistive pill operation. One specific problem I'm really excited about is assistive feeding. So, uh, and that's like a very difficult, both robotics and interaction problem. Like how do you like manipulate like food items that are deformable? And then how do you like bring the food to a person's mouth? Like knowing it is like comfortable and safe, like the fork is coming to your mouth, like how do you make sure that that interaction is safe and what sort of models should we keep track of like the person like in such scenarios. So that's a space that I'm very excited about these days. Other than that, uh, in terms of other applications, we are in general very interested in other dyadic interactions. So we had like a recent project where we had a person play a game of air hockey with a robot, which was a lot of fun, um, or like moving a table like with another agent, those types of things. And more on the human AI interaction side of things, we are looking at building adaptive agents, like negotiation agents that can negotiate over time, uh, or like play a game of like Hanabi or Overcooked. So those, that's just the application side. So now that we have all these like applications, right? Like what is the right way of like modeling the person and modeling the interaction? And I think some of the issues that is already like mentioned by all the panelists, like we kind of like deal with the same thing. So um, we kind of, we started looking at this problem from a learning perspective, modeling it as an MVP, trying to learn a reward function or learn a policy based on collected interaction data. So we do quite a bit of work in the space of learning from uh, demonstrations or learning from preferences. Uh, but that's in general hard as Elaine was saying, right? Like data is limited. So what should we do in this space where we have like very limited data? Um, and then I completely agree with Elaine, right? Interactively learning with like a person in the loop, that is kind of like a very good way of going about it. You're doing some work in that domain, trying to actively query the person and kind of like look for the right information, like ask informative questions or show like different preferences and ask people, well, how would you rank these like different behaviors? Um, we we're looking at physical feedback. So how would you like physically like push a robot and what sort of information is present in that, in that, in that source of data? So I, I definitely think data is a big problem and we take learning based type approaches to these problems. And 
part of the problem that we haven't seen the same sort of advances that deep learning has made, let's say to NLP or to vision, to, to the field of let's say robotics or interaction is we just don't have like the right enough, enough data to just like learn from it. Um, that's one thing. The other thing that, the other approach that we have recently been taking um, when we think about interaction specifically is to try to extract the right representation. Uh, because when you think about a dyadic interaction and you have to like, let's say move a table with another agent, there are a lot of underlying information there, but I'd argue a lot of times people don't keep track of like high dimensional beliefs of what the other agent is going to do next. Instead, they keep track of like things like roles, like are you leading or are you following? Like those types of like low dimensional um, things like intents or goals, right? Like as, as this workshop is about. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to leverage ideas from representation learning to directly extract what is that low dimensional information? What is the sufficient statistic that captures the task so we can coordinate better with another agent without like doing like recursive belief modeling? Um, that's an area I'm very excited about and I think can help with some of these dyadic interaction or multi-agent interaction problems. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Felipe, please. So, uh, I mean, I, in terms of the models I worked with, right, I've, I think I've worked with basically, well, mm -mm, a, lot, a lot of stuff, right? I've worked with MDPs, I've worked with classical planning models, HTNs, uh, more recently, uh, I'm trying to work with RL as well. But uh, this first application that I did, right, I, I mean, I, I basically chose MDPs because it made sense at the time, and I wanted to learn about that, I mean, fresh uh, off my PhD. Uh, but the thing about uh, MDPs that I was not too comfortable with, uh, and I think it's kind of a common sort of uh, uh, criticism, is, is that it's very hard for you to narrow kind of agent preferences to this single number, right, the, the, in the reward function. Uh, and so uh, at the time, I tried to kind of model this, uh, uh, or to, to use a model that I was... Uh, um, that I was familiar with, which was these HTN plan libraries, which you can look at as sort of a policy, right? Uh, that's not exactly an inverse reinforcement learning uh, problem because it's not samples, right? It's actually the stuff that you assume uh, uh, the agent is running, uh, the agent you're observing, right? And in, in, in our case, it kind of worked because, uh, I mean, since this is kind of a military domain, they, they have very prescriptive ways of uh, doing stuff. And so you could look at kind of the, the field manuals and this kind of stuff to say, well, this is what this guy is supposed to be doing at this point, right? Uh, and so we try to derive this, uh, 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 this policy we're observing and this uh, reward function out of the, the what we expected the, the agent we were observing to be doing, right? And, and, and we reconstructed an MDP out of that. Um, and, uh, and then you can use all the kind of all sorts of uh, things the probabilities of the MDP uh, give you to 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 try to imagine where uh, or to infer where the agent you're observing is going. Right. So so that's one of the models that that we did. Uh, and at the time, I mean, we, uh, I didn't use machine learning at all, right? Um, basically, because uh, I mean, to me at least, it, it wasn't such an easy thing to do, and there was no data basically which again, we'll always get back to the fact that uh, if you're using machine learning, you need to have data and depending on how complex the environment you're uh, using, you need to have a lot of data. And that's usually either you, uh, uh, either you use a data set that everyone else is using, right? Uh, and so chances of you innovating there are small or you have to build your own. And then if you don't have a lot of resources to build your own data set, that's another problem you have. Right? Uh, but beyond that, right, I mean, I've, we've done, uh, uh, especially with some of my students with PDDL models that basically we get out of BIPC. Uh, and uh, the other kind of domains we were using was to try to guess kind of the recipe uh, some, where somebody was uh, cooking, right? And so we, there are uh, 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 more than one data set of, uh, you know, fixed camera of somebody cooking, uh, and so we, that, that is, since we have data sets that look kind of uh, usable, then we started using um, machine learning there. And so one of the, the things that, uh, and this is a more recent thing, which I think 
is uh, is is co cool in terms of planning too that we're trying to basically derive the PDDL models out of this uh, unstructured data, like images, right? So we see this kind of this sequence of images and assume that the sequence of images are describing these uh, uh, state transitions, right? And so we try to to uh, and following this uh, uh, very interesting approach from uh, Masatawa Sai, if you're not familiar with uh, uh, his work, I recommend highly. Uh, but basically trying to to well use deep learning to get this kind of fake logic-like representation in the embedding that you get from an autoencoder looking at this data, and that from this sequence of uh, your pseudo logical representation in the embedding, try to reconstruct PDDL out of it. And so that thing I think was one of the, the, the more interesting things in terms of using the, or mixing, you know, machine learning and classical planning that we've done recently, um, that you can use the machine learning side to deal with the images and the structured data, right? But also run these extremely fast uh, uh, classical planning-based uh, uh, goal recognition algorithms that uh, my, my group have been working on um, for for quite a while. So I, uh, I, I think in, in, in that respect, it was kind of the best of both worlds, right? And, and, and again, then that's kind of learned model, then it's PDDL model, usually discrete. I mean, we've done, we've done some, I've never done actual robotics, right? Which would be, Kind of continues, even though I was in the Robotics Institute, I never touched that. Uh, uh, I think robots are scary, or at least scary for my simpleton mind. Um, but but in the end, I like this this idea of uh, uh, of having some sort of logic-like model uh, because it allows us to give some sort of interpretability that I think uh, machine learning often lacks. Right. Um, I mean, either you, you trust the model, or I mean, there, there's lots of work on trying to explain machine learning models, but to me, at least, the, the, ex, the explanations from machine learning models always, have always been kind of unsatisfying. But that's my own personal bias because I've worked with classical planning uh, models most of, of my life. Uh, and I'm not going to say that this is reality, this, this is my perception of it. Um, and uh, I guess just to I'm just going to stop here uh, uh, so as not to kind of uh, answer the next question as well in terms of uh, how we consider the, the agents we are observing and all of that. But, but, but in all, I think it's, it's cool to not be too dogmatic about the, the, the kind of model you're using. Right? Uh, and that's one of the things that's kind of aggravate me is that if you're talking to uh, I mean, Classical planning guys will say that uh, ah, the, uh, learning is a fad. And if you talk to, well, not all of them, but some of them. And if you talk to machine learning guys, uh, they say, ah, no, this is kind of, I mean, if you listen to Yen Lacombe, for example, say, yeah, no, you, you lost classical AI. You yeah, throw out the garbage, just need more data. And I think that it's neither one nor the other. Uh, and and that's why I think it's interesting to look at uh, all the kind of representations you, you have available. Okay, thank you very much. Um, we have a couple of follow-up questions and in the interest of time, we had prepared two more questions, but I think it would be interesting that the audience interact with uh, each one of you and you also interact with uh, each other. So how about uh, Rao, please? Uh, did you have a question? Hi, yeah. So I was actually curious um, with respect to something that Elaine uh, mentioned um, about human in the loop learning, which I think is quite a, a, a tempting direction, but I also find that most robotics methods um, I mean, so the sample complexity issue becomes even bigger issue unless we have humans who have nothing else to do other than just keep on giving lots and lots of demonstrations. You need to somehow squeeze a lot more out of individual interactions with the humans, which requires like a lot of background knowledge, something that robotics people don't seem to believe in. So I was just curious what, how she handles that. So, yeah. Yeah, so, um... 
you're absolutely right. The human in the loop learning makes the complex sample complexity. This is why I was saying it keeps me up at night, right? <laughs> I'm thinking about extremely, extremely data limited situations. That said, um, when you look at some of the human in the loop, human guided reinforcement learning, I find that there are sort of two schools and neither of them I find very satisfying. So one is you essentially, I would argue, over exploit the human's information. You get one good path to the goal or a couple good paths to the goal or a couple good you know, trajectories through the state space. And you just kind of like learn that and redo that every time. The other approach is you say, maybe you have the human is giving you some advice or suggestions and it's, it's almost always like thumbs up, thumbs down. So the human's just sitting there watching you and go, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. So in fact, there, I would argue you're underexploiting the human's knowledge of the task and the knowledge of the structure. So what I think about, I've been thinking about a lot with my students, you know, very recently is the situation where you have maybe some sparse reward in your model that says like, okay, we're going to get the block to the goal or something like that. Um, and you have a person who's available to give you some feedback or even maybe a demonstration and thinking about how can we incorporate both the reward function and use the human to help us make, especially early in learning, make good decisions about what actions to take so that I can start to really understand the structure, the reward landscape that I'm dealing with. Um, and some of our preliminary results are actually pretty exciting in terms of like using a human, even giving either like that there are ways to use a human to actually dramatically increase your learning speed. Um, because uh, it's especially early in learning where I feel like like early in learning, especially in a sparse reward kind of environment, robot is wandering in the desert. And it's just wandering, it's gonna wander around until something good happens. And then it's gonna kind of start figuring out what to do. Um, but people are really good at seeing the big structure of a problem and really bad at, uh, really bad at, doing the kind of like local fussy stuff. So I think that's where I think there's a lot of like really interesting work still to be done thinking about, um, like I said, using human guided reinforcement learning and also um, looking at, we've been thinking about other kinds of feedback, like what actually, what can a human tell you about a problem about your learning problem that you're dealing with as a robot? What can a human tell you that you can actually um, take advantage of instead of just like sitting there thumbs up thumbs down right that's not really how humans learn from each other and it's like a person could be giving you much more um, so I guess I agree that sample complexity is a big problem but I think actually having a human in the loop can at least break even with some of the like sim to real kinds of approaches um, in terms of you get a lot more information and you get fewer samples. So, so if I might just kind of make one small short comment, I, I pretty we have worked in this direction too. I would love to follow up with you. I put in a uh, paper there. Um, you know, the ultimately, even though that paper exists and we also have some positive results on explanation augmented feedback, ultimately, I think you and I would be happier if in fact the feedback can be given in a higher level than pixel level and saliency regions. And uh, that is where things fall apart. So in some sense, you would need some kind of a lingua franca where the higher level guidance is given and the uh, robot is able to use it, which is something that you know in this community, I mean, at least part of this community, payer community will actually be very happy to do that, but not so much the robotics community, which is completely been in deep reinforcement learning mindset. So that's where it's a trickier thing for me to believe that you know, humans will become some kind of a matrix, uh, you know, instead of matrix batteries, they will become this sort of thumbs up, thumbs down with maybe some explanation givers. And that's not something that we would want, I guess. But I think it's certainly, I think I agree with several of the comments you're making it, you know, it'd be great if we can figure out a higher level interaction between the humans and uh, these agents. Thanks. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. Yeah, there's lots of lots of uh, interesting work to be done in this space. Can I add a few points on that because I think that's very interesting. 
Uh, so, so just to add on the point that, yeah, so in the deep RL like space, right? Like if you have like two AI agents, like how, how would you like bring in the human in the loop in that setting? There is actually quite a bit of work in that domain trying to like fine tune at the end with humans. Like for example, one of the recent works we were looking at was a human playing a game of air hockey with a robot and that was trained by deep, using deep reinforcement learning. But the idea was at the end of the day, once you bring in the human, you can actually fine tune and adapt to the person. So, so we were using the human input kind of like at the late, later layers of, of training. And like most of the two hour, three hour of training was done by two robots just trying to like play a game, game of air hockey together. So, so there are, I, I do agree, it's incredibly difficult, like especially like in some of these very learning heavy works to bring in the human feedback, but there are some ways of dealing with it. Um, another thing I want to mention, there is also um, this idea of learning from suboptimal human data and just like the fact that there are so many different sources of data that we can tap into. Um, and we in general have a lot of suboptimal like demonstrations, just like observations. And I think there was like a lot of active work in that domain too that could potentially help uh, and give us benefits of using offline data. And one quick last thing is also, you're right, like collecting data in the robotics domain is really difficult. Like, is there a person going to sit down and give you data? But there are a bunch of crowdsourcing projects. For example, there's this Robotork project from uh, Sylvia Severus's group at uh, Stanford where they are crowdsourcing, collecting data from like humans teleoperating robots, which I think is an exciting direction too. I think, I think to, to some extent, you know, oh. having oh, domain- sorry. sorry, go ahead. Excuse me. Uh, we are almost running out of time and we have one more uh, question, follow-up question that we would like to address from the audience. Uh, please, you can discuss later, I guess. Uh, so right. Sachin, <laughs> uh, Sachin, if you have a, one question about the observations. Uh, yes, my question was basically about uh, you know, having noise in the observation trace, whether you are using the observation for deriving a policy or learning to predict human movements. Uh, I want, I would like if the if any panel members would like to talk about what sort of uh, Noise they have had to deal with in their applications, and what are the recommendations to handling noise in human agent interactions, especially if the human and the agent happen to be interacting for a long time? Because us humans, we have a quite a, I think our notion of noise is kind of very volatile and it changes over time. So I was uh, wondering if you could talk about some of the experiences you had dealing with this issue and what were your findings. Thanks. I'll just say something very quickly. We have very little time. So um, I think that a lot of issues can be dealt by bringing in more context. The more context you bring into a situation, the more of stability you bring into a situation. The less context you have, um, the more likely noise can be interpreted as, as, as valid new, new state that you're in. But lots of things just can't happen if there is more context. So I think that uh, that's, that's a, also a lesson that, that uh, I wanted to bring up in the context of the, uh, what are the main challenges? I think that it's very hard like we saw in NLP early work, it's very hard to understand sentences outside of a context and to have meaning outside of a context. And it's similarly, it's very hard to understand actions without the complete behavior. It's, under, it's hard to understand the behavior outside of context of interaction. And it's hard to understand interaction outside of the context of social norms that govern the interactions. Once you add all these constraints, so a lot of things, the noise don't make a lot of sense. Okay, thank you. So due to the time constraints, uh, I think we will uh, go to the last question. So if you, anyone uh, wants to say something uh, very quickly because we have uh, three minutes, so sorry, I, I wish we had uh, Two hours more to discuss and uh, and uh, address the other questions. So, 
but uh, okay. Uh, what, in your opinion, uh, would be the main challenges in creating a product like Siri or a service robot that will be able to perform fair? So, if in, anyone wants to say something about uh, this question, please uh, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. I see Elaine said sample efficiency. Yeah, I've already talked too much, but that's my one. Two <laughs> no worries. Go ahead. Now that's that's all I wanted to say. Sample efficiency. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, if I uh, may quickly, I think that one of the, the key things that I think is a bit frustrating is. Uh, with many of these uh, products is that it's usually these one-shot interactions, right? Usually it's more than one-shot interactions, usually a gimmick, right? That you you can't really say, well, you, you ask something for Siri or for Alexa, right? And it didn't get what you wanted, right? Uh, but then you have to start the interaction on you if you wanted to do whatever the heck you wanted to do, right? So there is no kind of a refinement of, uh, of uh, 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 no, no dialogue itself. So I think that, uh, and I guess this is this is a problem uh, kind of related to what Shlomo was talking about before. One is keeping context within the, that interaction, right? maintaining the context in a meaningful way to so that the, 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 the device kind of remembers how you started and, and tries to get what you're going, right? So I think that this issue of context, I think, uh, uh, is critical there. Um, and, and, uh, well, basically having this uh, uh, recognition that has the human in the loop during the recognition. And that's something that I've seen very, very uh, uh, little work on. I mean, there is some work, but I think that this is something, I guess because it's very challenging, there are not that many people that are uh, 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 attacking it. And whoever does it, I think, well, uh, is in for uh, quite a good work. 